<laughs> so this is a special meeting. Right, this is a special meeting. So I'm just going to So there's no, there's no unagendized public comment at special meetings. So just I'm not smiling about that. <laughs> you're, not, you're not sad about that? <laughs> yeah, so yeah, just okay. call it up. Say, I'm it. calling to order the special meeting of the Santa Monica City Council. Okay. Thank you. I am. Are you ready? Good. Good evening. Welcome to the special meeting of the Santa Monica City Council. Um, clerk, can you call the roll? Council Members Wick. Here. Yeah. Council Member Para is absent. Council Member Davis. Here. Council Member Tarosis is absent. Council Member De La Torre. And we can turn our own mics on. Here. Here. <clears throat> As this is a special city council meeting, public comment is restricted to only items listed on this agenda. And I'll remind members of the audience, if you could turn your phones off or on to vibrate as not to disrupt the meeting, that would be greatly appreciated. And our first item is the closed session. And if the clerk, assistant city clerk, could read the items for us. First, uh, the first item is actually public input on agendized items, which is closed session. And we do not have any public input for that. Uh, and then for closed session, item 4A, we have conference with legal counsel on existing litigation, Smith versus the city of Santa Monica. Item 4B, conference with legal counsel, existing litigation, Yossi Shimshi versus city of Santa Monica. Uh, item 4C, conference with real estate negotiator, uh, address 1431 Second Street, uh, parking structure 6. City negotiators, Jennifer Taylor and David Martin, owner of record, City of Santa Monica, persons to be negotiated with, Jerry Cottle, founder of Rooftop Cinema Club, under negotiation or price and terms of payment. Item 4D, conference with real estate negotiator, address 1654 19th Street of City TV. City negotiators are Jennifer Taylor and David Martin, owner of record, City of Santa Monica, persons to be negotiated with are Willie Winkerhofer, a Winkenhofer, I'm sorry, Fidelis Advisors under negotiation price and terms of payment. Com uh, item 4E, conference with real estate negotiator, address at 1444 7th Street, Old Fire Station 1, city negotiators, Jennifer Taylor and David Martin, owner of record, city of Santa Monica, persons to be negotiated with, Will Winkenhofer, Fidelis Advisors under negotiation price and terms of payment. And payment. Uh, and item 4F, conference with real estate negotiator, address 1444 7th Street, Old Firehouse Station 1, uh, city, negotiator, city negotiator Jennifer Taylor and David Martin, owner of record, City of Santa Monica, persons to be negotiated with, Jesse Slansky, West Hollywood Community Corporation, under negotiation, price and terms of payment. And if I could ask our city attorney what time he believes we will be back as he looks into his crystal ball. I believe we're predicting 615. So we'll be able to reconvene at 615. Yes. And my understanding is that the regular meeting will then convene at that time. Okay. Thank you so much. And for anyone watching, we will see you in about an hour and a half or so. Thank you so much.
Okay, if we can come to order, please. And first, as we finish the special meeting, uh, we need a uh, readout from the city attorney of what has transpired in closed so, session. All of the matters were heard, and there is nothing to report out. Okay, so that will uh, conclude the special meeting of the Santa Monica City Council that convened at 430 today. I want to thank City Council members for coming. Hopefully that will uh, make our remaining burden of our meeting a little shorter and allow the public uh, to stay awake during our meeting. So uh, let's convene our regular meeting now of the Santa Monica City Council. And we're convening this at um, 6.44 p.m. And uh, could we have, um, I'm not going to ask Council Member Negretti because she's pretty hoarse, but Council Member Tarosis, could you do the Pledge of Allegiance today? Thank you very much. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands. One nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Could we have the clerk read the roll call, please? Councilmember Zwick? Here. Councilmember Parra? Here. Councilmember Davis? Here. Councilmember Tarosis? Here. Councilmember De La Torre is absent tonight. Mayor Pro Tem Negrete? Here. <laughs> and Mayor Brock? Here. Thank you very much, clerk. Yes. And my microphone went off, it came back on. Public input. Public input is permitted only on items not on the agenda that are within the subject matter jurisdiction of the city. State law prohibits the city council from taking any action on items not listed on the agenda, including issues raised under this agenda item. And it looks like we have 12 people on the list. I'm going to call the first five names, and if you could please line up against the wall. Jerry Rubin, Aster One. Jesus Gonzalez, Anya Baroff, and I apologize in advance, Abrahe Seifu. You can all please stand and line up against the wall. Hold on one minute, Jerry. Hold on one second. Again, if your name was called, could you please line up on the east side, east wall? Again, Jerry Rubin, Aster One, Jesus Gonzalez, Anya Baroff, and Abaret Safu. Thank you, Mr. Rubin. Well, thank you, uh, Jerry Rubin, Santa Monica President. Hold on one second. Go ahead, Jerry. Thank you very, very much. No. Mayor Brock. Mayor Pro. Or. Vice Mayor, Lana Negretti, Honorable City Council Members, City Manager, City Attorney, City Clerk, our other dedicated city staff, police officers, and fellow Santa Monicans. Let me just say that I hope 2024 is the very, very best year for each of you and yours and for the city of Santa Monica, and we can make it happen. I do want to say I was very sad to read <laughs> that a Jewish menorah was destroyed up there on Montana, and I've heard anti-Semitic remarks before, and I've heard other hateful racist remarks against others, too. And I know Santa Monica, and we're all united against that, but I hope that we can do something about that. And I don't know exactly what, but I just don't, don't ever like the approach of ignoring it. So I don't know what could be done, but it was very, very sad. And again, I just want to be positive and say uh, let's all work together for win-win solutions 
to eliminate all this crazy stuff and make Santa Monica even better than the great city it has been and continues to be. Thank you. Esther One. Hi, I'm going to read off my notes. Um, I'm here because we haven't had electricity in our home for a month and five days. Uh, we had a meter, to, uh, we were supposed to have a meter to be installed. Um, our property manager um, of the affordable housing that we live in made a service request to the city to install the meter for us a month ago. And she was, a she was able to get a service case number. According to Edison, uh, this process shouldn't take more than two weeks. Um, and we have been calling at least three times a day to check on the status and leave a voice message, but no one ever gives, gives us any response. Um, uh, our property manager also mentioned that she has been calling every day and that she's not able to get a hold of anyone. Uh, she mentioned that uh, this, this is unusual. A friend told me to come here and seek help. Uh, not having electricity is very frustrating, especially because um, we are not able to use our refrigerator, our phones, um, computers, um, and um, any other things that require electricity. Um, I hope you can help us this get sorted out soon. Thank you. That's all. Okay, if you could walk over by the clerk stand, I think this assistant city manager would love to talk to you Thank for a minute. You so Thank much. you so much. Next, we have Jesus Gonzalez. Hello, good night. Buenas noches, concejales, alcalde Brock. Mi nombre es Jesús González y trabajo en el Hotel Hampton in Santa Monica. Como ustedes saben, estamos en huelga por ya seis meses, los cuales no han sido fáciles y ahora que viene la Navidad, <coughs> es triste que aún, que aún Ambridge no ha firmado el contrato. Peor aún, seguimos recibiendo violencia durante nuestra huelga. Good evening, good evening, um, Consul Brooke. My name is Jesus Gonzalez, and I work at the hotel in Hampton, Santa Monica. As you know, we've been on strike for almost six months, which have not been easy at all. And right now, as this um, Christmas is coming, it's really sad because Ambridge still have not signed the contract, which is even worse is that we still have been suffering violence uh, during our strike. Ayer fuimos agredidos por trabajadores, vecinos y turistas, al grado que uno de, de nuestros compañeros fue agredido físicamente por un trabajador de mi mismo hotel. Les pedimos a ustedes que nos apoyen, que los hoteles firmen el contrato y que pongan fin a la violencia. Felices fiestas. Yesterday, unfortunately, we were assaulted by one of the workers at the hotel and even from people that live near the area and from tourists. There was to the point that one of my worker, or one of my coworkers was assaulted physically by one of, by another colleague at the hotel. Please, we ask you that you please help us for the hotels to sign the contract and put an end to this violence. Happy, happy holidays. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next is Anya Baroff and Ms. Baroff. Before you speak, I'm gonna call five more names. Uh, Jasmina Cruz, Bunny Butt, Rhea DeBloop, Anthony Rosello, Sarah Lee, uh, and Christina Santiago. Go ahead. Okay. My name is Anya Baroff, and I've lived in Santa Monica for the entirety of my life and have loved growing up here and living here. Um, but lately, I'd like to speak about uh, police misconduct within the community since we rely on the police for keeping our community safe on all capacities. 
Um, so when members of the community come forward with criminal matters to the police, they should be taken seriously. I've noticed recently that there's been an increase in victim blaming within the system that should be advocating on our behalf to keep our community safe without any fear of any of us coming forward when going to the police. Um, and I think that more education and advocacy for the police could help enact and keep advocating for the safety of all of us, whether it be because we're women or people with disabilities or anyone um, within our diverse community. And I think adhering to the protection of our constituents here um, without any fear of retaliation or harm for speaking out about injustice within pol potential police misconduct or within the community is something that we should really take into further consideration because recently I believe that there's been a rise in that, especially for vulnerable um, citizens and representatives that, that come forward. So, and again, no person should be called mentally ill or be discriminated against for standing up for themselves and standing up for police misconduct when they decide to report that. They should be taken seriously and they should be admired for the strength to come forward within those capacities. And I think that accountability for harm and threats to the victims that have come forward is not okay in any capacity, nor is deflecting blame onto anyone who feels that they have been mistreated by the police when reporting a crime. So I would like to end by saying I hope that can change and I hope we can keep our city safe um, in all capacities. Thank you very much. Next is Abrahe Seifu. Hello, City uh, Santa Monica City Council. Speak, speak really close to this, okay. okay. Hello, Santa Monica City Council and my Mayor Brack. My name is Abrahat and I am a hotel person, courtyard Marriott, and I am help helped open that hotel also. I am a person, a proud Santa Monica City resident. I have, I have been, I have been on strike at my hotel since July 1st. Get strong every day. But I also, last, last night we were again met with, uh, violence at Hampton and just like from the Fermat Hotel uh, a person uh, straw, spray her soda soda uh, on me and my co-workers and resident again uh, last Sunday uh, beer uh, beer uh, throw at me that the glass broken on my body. I was wearing a custom Christmas costume that saved my life. And the we need the safety at work at the anywhere we were. Uh, assaulted uh, when we are a strike. We need your help. Please help us to pass to sign the contract. Thank you very much. And thank you. Merry Christmas. Next we have uh, Jasmina Cruz. Buenas noches, señores concejales de Santa Mónica. Mi nombre es Yasmina Cruz. Soy trabajadora de Hampton East, eh, Santa Mónica. Y he trabajado ahí por un año. Good evening, good evening, City Council, uh, people of Santa Monica. Uh, good, uh, my name is uh, Yasmina Cruz, and I am a worker at the Hampton Inn in Santa Monica, and I've been working there for about a year. Queremos 
y estamos luchando que firmen nuestro contrato. Hemos estado en huelga ya cinco veces. De hecho, ahora estamos en huelga. Uh, so I want and I am fighting uh, to make sure that we get a new contract. Um, and I've been doing that by being on strike now five times and actually I'm on strike right now. And Anoche mis compañeros y yo pasamos por una violencia por parte de un trabajador del hotel. Es algo que yo no esperaba ver este en este país. Me recuerda de la violencia de mi país, Nicaragua. Yo vine acá para sentirme segura He aquí, pero no puedo con esa agresión en el lugar de trabajo. So last night, my coworkers and myself, uh, we we suffered yet again from violence um, by another uh, worker from the hotel. Um, it's something that I never thought would happen here in this country. Um, it's making me think about my memories and violence in my country of Nicaragua. And I came to this country to feel safe. Um, and I do not want to go through that kind of aggressive behavior again, and especially in my workplace. Les exijo a la ciudad que por favor nos apoyen en parar la violencia en nuestros hoteles. También les pido por favor que las, les presionen a los hoteles para que firmen nuestro contrato. Todos merecemos algo justo y digno para nuestra familia. Gracias, Dios los bendiga y felices fiestas. Um, so I'm asking you all in the city of Santa Monica to c please continue supporting us and stopping the violence in our workplaces at these hotels. I also ask you to please put pressure on the hotels that they sign our new contract. We all deserve it. Um, something dignified for our families. Thank you. May God bless you and happy holidays. And I want to remind everyone that if you feel you're the victim of an assault or a victim of a crime, in Santa Monica tonight, we have our police chief in the rear of the room, so he can talk to you and assign someone to try and help you. Uh, I, I've heard now twice, three times that people are victims in this room. We want to make sure that we take care of you. So please talk to our police officers if you feel like it or ask uh, assistant city manager or someone else for help. Thank you. Next speaker is Bunny Butt. No bunny butt? Okay. Rhea DeVolt? DeVolt? I'm sorry. Good afternoon, City Council and Mayor Brock. Who is Local 11? Who is Unite Here Local 11? They are a group of professional grifters who cry about violence towards them where is the body cam footage from August 5th? Secondly, they've had, they've given us nothing more than over 150 days of urban terrorism created by their megaphones, shoving megaphones in people's faces, stealing people's Amazon packages locally, being nasty to the residents. This was never about a wage increase for people who have zero skills, let alone English skills. What this was about was union dues. This whole time, Local 11, if, I don't know if you guys look at Eyes on 11, this has been about union dues. Where does that money go? It doesn't go towards their health care. It does not go towards their housing. This goes towards political campaigns, political prostitutes who got bought by Local 11 so they could have a firm stronghold in cities like ours and ruin the peaceful living that we've gotten to know in Southern California that we work for. Local 11 needs to stay in their lane. If we're going to make Santa Monica great again and restore the purity of Santa Monica and what it stands for in being a quiet beach city, we can't have them in here with this. A lot of people may not remember right away who is endorsed on here, such as Jesse, Caroline, and Gleam by Local 11, but I will make it a point to know and make them know who is endorsed by them. Who are they to go to people to get them to register to vote? Who are they to be concerned about mobility in bike lanes? That's not what their lane is. They need to stay in their lane. If it's about hotel workers, let it be about that. But do not come into our city. We don't go into your cities 
trying to ravage things up and, and create all the noise that you've created and destroy people's weddings, birthdays. I mean, the list is endless. So with that said, I'm just asking that we stop letting local 11 come into our cities and ruin them. Thank you very much. The next speaker is Anthony Rizzello. And Mr. Rizzello, before you start, we do have one more speaker, Dora Hernandez. If you could please stand up against the wall. Go ahead, Mr. Rizzello. Great. Yes. Uh, good evening, City Council. I'm here again to address the issue with Unite Local 11. We've been coming here for a few months now addressing the issue with the absurd tactics and disregard for the residents who live in the area. Now, the more I look into the whole situation, the more I start to realize what's going on. The fact that the city would be complicit with the whole situation, the more I realize that the city council was in bed with Unite, and Unite basically owns you, and they basically run you. They are the most corrupt union there is. They're, they don't care about their own workers' pay. They care more about how many members they can get, which means more, more money and dues for the leaders. They have been sued numerous times by their own members, because they have seen through their own leaders smoke and mirrors, just like so many residents are now opening their eyes to. So let's follow the money and see whose hands are in the cookie jar, who's just being complicit for what, for their own personal gain. This is just the surface, I'm sure, but the fact that you have been playing this at the resident's expense is total bullshit. The fact that they hired agitators to come out and escalate everything should tell you something. They had ads hiring people for a day to come out with them to, to go and create loud, obnoxious noise. This is ridiculous. They're not even the union. Everything about it is just wrong. They still go in to work and collect a paycheck, but scream when they come out and protest and make no sense. Again, just ridiculous. Thank you, sir. Sarah Lee. All right. So last week, we've been coming here for three months now. Last week, I read this at the end and I was cut off, so I want to start with it. Why are laws made? Laws are made to protect our general safety and ensure our rights as citizens against abuses by people, organizations, and by the government itself. So we're requesting for a noise ordinance to be put in place to protect our future because this could happen to us again. And like I said last week and the other speakers have said, we don't want to keep coming back. We've been coming in for three months. So we're going to go into 2024, and I hope, like Jerry Rubin said, it'll be a good year. So we really want you to help us. You know, residents have been making it very, very clear that we need your help to put something in place, something, an ordinance, a noise ordinance, 65 decibels for 15 minutes is the law, but they're going up to 110. So if we can get them to follow at least to 80 or 70, we're okay with that. Just so there's some, some sort of peace. Okay. And then also our taxes in Santa Monica are extremely high. 10.25. Orange County is 7.75. Silicon Valley is 9.3. So we're at the top. Mountain View is 9.1, and that's where Google, Apple, and Facebook are. So we, can sh we should be able to expect to have a peaceful home, okay? Because a peaceful home can prevent burnout, reduce stress, improve health and well-being, and create a sense of safety. When you're at home, that's when you're supposed to have complete peace, okay? And it's perhaps the only environment that you can control since you pay for it. You pay rent. Thank you. Help us, please. Next speaker is Mr. Jerry Rubin. Good evening, Council. Good evening. Good evening, everybody. My name is Cristina Santiago. Uh, I will tell you um, who Local 11 is. Local 11 fights for the rights of workers, of hardworking people. As all of you know, we've been on strike since July 2nd, uh, and we've been through so many things, and I 
my respects for all the workers that they've been through this. And we are going to continue, and we're going to keep coming to City Hall as many times as we need to until we get the contract we deserve. And I urge the, uh, the city attorney and the chief of police to review every single case we have presented to them, to review in depth all of the videos, and to make sure that we are respected and that the laws are being followed. Please, and I urge the city councils to talk to the hotels, settle this for once and for all so everybody can have the peace that we deserve. We're not doing anything wrong. We're just fighting for what we deserve. Thank you very much. Happy holidays. Happy holidays. Thank you. And our last speaker on this item is Dora Hernandez. Good evening, city council members and Mayor Brooke. My name is Dora Hernandez. <clears throat> and we really need your help um, to put pressure into these hotels in Santa Monica. Um, as you know, and co-workers are here too, that last night we were again met with violence at the Hampton, like just what we experienced at the Fairmont. But these people have not been, you know, they have there have been no consequences to them. And unfortunately, yesterday I was also um, affected by these bottles uh, of beer, you know, throwing at us. Thank God, you know, we were aware and nothing happened, but still, it is really unfortunate that uh, police comes and, and there's nothing to be done to these people. So we really pray that we get this new contract for Christmas, and please, we ask you that once again, you hold these workplaces responsible for their actions and your support for our fight. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. And that is the end of public speakers on that item? That is correct. So we move on to the public input for agenda items under closed session, special agenda items, or consent calendar. Public input under closed session, special agenda items, and consent calendar only. No public input is permitted on ordinances for second reading and adoption. And we have two speakers for this item. Uh, we have Jonathan Foster and Denise Barton. Hi, <clears throat> I think I'm speaking on the pay raise for the city manager and the police uh, police chief. And uh, definitely agree with the police chief raise. I, I haven't personally uh, been that happy with this, the city manager. And, and one of the things I wanted to talk about, though, which he doesn't seem like, there's uh, Roy Benavides, Medal of Honor winner, Green Beret, he said that for his 25 years of service, he felt like he's been overpaid for his service to his country. Seems a little bit unlike the city manager and, and even some of the other people that get huge paychecks here. Then he said there, there will never be enough money to print nor enough gold in Fort Knox for me to have to keep me from doing what I did. I, I wish we had people like that serving instead of giving these people the hugest paychecks that doesn't seem to equal uh, uh, the, the, the disparity in the low-wage workers who don't get paid enough as they assign to these people that the city manager does a more important job than the people moving the trash. And my question has always been, how much do, will we have to pay you to move trash and to wipe down bathrooms? And whatever you're getting paid, shouldn't we be paying the people who wipe the bathrooms down and move the trash? Shouldn't we be paying them what we're going to pay the city manager? Shouldn't we be paying the people who wipe the toilets what you pay the city attorney? That's what I think. And I think he's getting paid too much. The police chief is not being paid enough. I, I support that. Santa Monica Police. Thank you, sir. Denise Barton. 
Good evening, for item 5L, in the case of the city manager, would this be an employee or CEO at a nonprofit benefiting financially above the core mission of the nonprofit? I ask because that's how it looks, considering you keep putting Chief Batista at a disadvantage. For example, not having the number of officers he needs to keep the city safe, and you keep going back to the number in 2019. But since that time, you've invited criminals and the homeless to the city by your actions. For example, your actions in, in the May 2020 riot and looting showed Santa Monica is an easy target which is a contributing factor to the increase in crime and homelessness in the city, but you still expect a lesser number of officers to be able to handle the calls from residents, residents businesses, visitors, criminals, and the homeless. Hopefully you can see you want him to do more with less. For all these reasons, I support Chief Batista's pay increase. But if you look at David White, the city manager, what do you see? How long now have residents come to these meetings telling of horrific experiences with the homeless and the criminal, and criminal actions? Yet David White just sits up there like it's okay. Would that mean that that's what you sitting up there want? But I don't personally think it's worth a 7 to 10% pay increase to $402,000, which puts which put in comparison to the West Hollywood city manager's pay of $345,000 or the Long Beach city manager's pay of $346,000 for a city with five times the population, makes it look as though the city manager is financially profiting um, from a nonprofit above the core of the nonprofit. Are you trying to lose your tax exempt status? Thank you. Thank you very much. And that concludes concludes public input on that item. Okay, we have a special agenda item, the recognition of outgoing board and commission members. Item 3A, recognition of outgoing board and commission members, and I will be presenting on this item. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Tonight, is, it is my pleasure to recognize the following board and commission members for their time and dedicated service to the City of Santa Monica. As you are all aware, serving on a board or commission is a volunteer role, and it is no small feat to recruit members to serve on these advisory bodies. The efforts put forth by each and every member is greatly appreciated and noteworthy. On behalf of the city, the city council, and the city clerk's office, we thank you for your commitment to serving this community. The following members mm -hmm. completed their terms of service between 2020 and 2023. I will only be calling the names of those who advised us that they would be able to attend tonight, although I will note that we have received a few cancellations tonight. As I call those names, I will then ask, uh, I'm sorry, after I call those names, I will then ask if there are any other former board or commission members in attendance that did not hear their name called uh, to please stand and state your name for the record. As your name is called, um, if you'll please stand um, and come forward and Xavier will present you with your certificate and gift. We ask that you please remain standing in the well until the end so that we can take a group photo. For those unable to attend tonight, the city clerk's office will make arrangements to ensure they receive their certificate and gift. And a full list of all outgoing members was posted with this agenda item. First, I, we recognize Cindy Aiken. Kay Ambries. Eve Brashtahan. No, okay. Uh, Joni Bayan. Leonora Kamner. Thank you so much. Gina DeBaca. Mario B uh, Fonda Bernardi. June Carol Hagen. John Hart. Thank you so much. Megan E. Kelly. Marielle Purcell, Daniela Martin,
Pamela Raymer. Eric Stoff. Taiwana Taylor. And last but not least, Jenny Vasquez Newsom. Are there any other former board or commission members who are in attendance tonight that did not hear their name called? Please stand. <laughs> Oh, I'm sorry, your name, sir? Uh, T.J. Hill. T.J. Hill, please step forward. Are there any other former Board of Commission members here whose name was not called? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Could you state your name again? T.J. Hill. T.J. Hill. Thomas John Hill. We're done for that item, yes. Oh. <laughs> item 3B, City Manager Report. It's time for the city manager's report, but first we want to report, and I want to let you know that it is the city manager's 50th birthday today. David White, can we give him a hand? Now, he has promised for his 50th birthday he will shave his beard in front of us today. <laughs> Somehow, I don't think, I'm, wait a minute, I may have had that message mixed. So, happy birthday, David, and your report. Th th thank you very much. Um, we're not shaving the beard. Uh, <laughs> so a good evening. We'll give you a piece of pie. <laughs> I'll take it. Uh, good evening, Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem, and City Council. Um, obviously, this is our last meeting of 2023, and I can't believe we made it to the end. The year has certainly flown by, and everyone on this dais has been very hard at work. And so I want to thank you uh, deeply from the bottom of my heart for all the work that you've put into the city. It's been so meaningful and so impactful. And it certainly has been the fuel for our recovery this year and certainly setting the stage for next year's recovery. One of the things that I certainly would like to do, um, and certainly this time of year is important for myself, is to just, again, reflect the gratitude, Mayor, that you shared for all of our city staff. But I would like to reflect that gratitude to all of our employees that are here, to all of our employees that are working hard day in and day out serving the city with the utmost care and attention. And I appreciate all of them and know that our collective success would not be without them serving the city so earnestly every single day. And as you know, it's certainly a year full of change. We have a new mayor. Council added two priorities to help guide our work. The community services department became two new departments. We said goodbye to many department heads and staff members who'd spent their careers with the city, and we welcome many new members to our team. 
We also saw many team members take on new roles and responsibilities within the city, and for that, I'm incredibly grateful. Speaking of which, I do want to introduce two individuals here in the room with us this evening. Uh, first, I want to officially introduce Oscar Santiago, our new Director of Finance, but by no means a new team member. Oscar has worked for the city for more than 32 years in various departments, most recently serving as our budget manager overseeing the operations, policy development, and implementation of the budget and procurement divisions. There is no better person to fill the big shoes that Gigi leaves behind, and I'm thrilled to see Oscar take on this role. And I can honestly say there is no person more committed to the city than Oscar. He's been with us for so many years, as I mentioned. His daughter attends schools here. He's, been, he's born and raised here. I mean, he's just an absolute true San Monican. So Oscar, thank you so much for serving. And we have another... And we have another well-known figure taking on a new position in the organization, and after 13 years with the city, including eight as the chief of staff in the city manager's office, Christopher Smith became our new deputy city manager yesterday. Thank you, Christopher. Filling the role left vacant when Anuj Gupta was appointed director of the Department of Transportation. In this role, which is incredibly elevated, Christopher oversees the Human Resources Department, Information Services, and Finance Departments, as well as the Chief of Staff Position 311, and importantly, our Diversity, Equity, Inclusion Team. And Christopher has been a leader in that field for many years for the city. Thank you, Christopher. The city has certainly bounced back mightily from the pandemic, and while our economic recovery work continues, I do want to take a moment to celebrate some of our successes. We saw more than 476 new businesses open this year across various industries throughout the city, with more on the way in 2024, and certainly there'll be some exciting openings coming. I encourage everyone to visit santamonica.gov forward slash news and read the two latest blog posts on all the new business activity and the ways that the council and staff have collaborated to make it easier to open and grow a business in Santa Monica. And also, please be sure to check out the annual Tis the Season Guide. There's a link to it on our homepage at santamonica.gov, which is bursting with food, shopping, and event information to brighten everyone's holiday season. And lastly, I want to wish everyone a happy Kwanzaa to all who celebrate. May you all have a very Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year and see you in 2024. And of course, of course, we'll celebrate this Merry Christmas with a big happy birthday to our mayor. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, thank you so much, City Manager White, and hope we can finish the meeting early enough so that you can celebrate with your wife and, and say hello to your daughter long distance. Um, clerk, you have a question I for do. all of us. Yes, I do. Uh, do any of the council members have any reports on travel since our last meeting last week? Seeing none. Consent calendar, all items will be considered and approved in one motion unless removed by a council member for discussion. In accordance with Charter Section 615, the adoption of all ordinances and resolutions shall be by reading of title only unless a council member de present dissents. No public discussion is permitted on ordinances for second reading and adoption. And I believe, Mayor Brock, you requested to have item 5B pulled from the consent calendar? Yes, I did. Would someone like to move the other items? We have a, a... I will move the remainder of the consent calendar, absent 5B. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, that, guys. That was well coordinated. Um, can we have a roll call vote? Councilmember Tarosis? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Negrete? Yes. Councilmember Davis? <coughs> yes. Councilmember Carr? Yes. Councilmember Zwick? Yes. Mayor Brock. Yes. Consent I items are passed. Item 5B, authorization to execute agreement with Alltech Industries, National Auto Fleet Group, and Folsom Lake Ford to purchase city vehicles. And do we have a staff member present? I sense that we do. Yes, you do. So I, I had... Um, I, I see this, and I've got some explanation of this, but I had a question about why we're buying our vehicles in Northern California. I know our ex-police chief uh, had been the police chief in Folsom prior, 
but I'm just concerned about why the purchases are being done 600 miles away from Santa Monica. Okay, I can answer that. Um, recently, especially after the pandemic and the uh, recent strikes there were with the UAE, um, UAW, I'm sorry, uh, employees, we've seen a significant shortage of vehicles, especially when it comes to Ford. We buy Ford exclusively for all, all our utility vehicles, as well as police interceptor, which <coughs> also specializes. We've been buying from Folsom through a statewide competitive bid in the state of California since forever. So the last purchase, we've done a 2015 purchase, a 2017 purchase, and a 2018 purchase. And again, source well, uh, it's not source well, but it's the state of California of general services cooperative agreement competitively bid at it, and Folsom is one, again, one of these companies. <coughs> so we get the advantage of uh, competitive bidding prices that our local dealerships do not have. They don't have police intercepts that we can buy from there. That's why we buy from Folsom. I hope I answered the question that you had. Made. So just to reiterate, it is competitive bidding. It is not favorited. Nope. And this is conducted through the state of California services. That is correct, which is a cooperative purchasing agency like SourceWell. The same thing in a so it sources state. the best price for the vehicles. That is absolutely correct. Okay, thank you so much. You're welcome, and happy holidays to all. I'll move the item. I, I have a question, though. Oh. Since you, you no, no, up go ahead. Um, can you just tell us, Stelios, how uh, this, the replacement of these vehicles aligns with our city's sustainability goals and commitment to reducing our carbon footprint? Yes. Um, there's recent um, state um, um, regulations that pass that we have to meet as a city, like every other city. We are lucky to say that we are ahead of that curve and we're always looking for the alternative vehicles aspects. When it comes to police PIUs or police interceptors, those are regularly engine gasoline vehicles for now. There's not an alternative solution to our needs right now, but what we do any vehicle that meets our needs, that there's alternative vehicle, that's what we do. And that's what we purchase. Great. So I, you, you are committed to accelerating any purchase of electric vehicles to the extent feasible for our service needs, correct? That is correct. And we have been doing that for some time now. We didn't okay. just start now. Great. Thanks. You're welcome. Are, I'll follow up on that. Are there no police interceptors that are electric or hybrid at this point? Not to my knowledge, no. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. And again, happy holidays to all. Um, I'm, I've had a motion moved by me, seconded by Council Member Parra. Can we have a roll call vote? Council Member Tarosis? <coughs> yes. Mayor Pro Tem Negrete? Yes. Council Member Davis? Yes. Council Member Parra? Yes. Council Member uh, Zwick? Yes. Mayor Brock? Yes. And that item passes 7-0. Mayor Evan, six, zero. <clears throat> agenda management, sorry, I'm losing my voice, request if possible. I'd, I'd like yes, to make a ahead. motion <clears throat> earlier than later on 11A, I'm so sorry, <clears throat> if we can move 11A to the next meeting because we don't have a full council and it's a pretty important subject around the airport, um, so I'm just making that motion. You know, the community's had a lot of input, and there should be seven of us up here when we talk about 11A. I move. She's seconding it. We have a motion moved and seconded. Is there questions or discussion? I'm sorry. Can I? Who was the second? <coughs> Para. Council Member Para. So um, I, have a, I have a question for the city manager. Is there any implication to putting this off? Because we don't have another meeting until late January. Um, yeah, if uh, anyone wants to uh, add anything, but uh, it, it just delays um, the process, uh, starting the process, and then we'd have to um, pay for the consultant to come back the, we have a representative from Sasaki here tonight, so we'd have to bring her back out again. <coughs> so if there's anything you want to add, or that's basically it. Yeah, it would, it would, it would delay 
I don't know if that's it. There we go. Um, it would delay the process, uh, most certainly. Right, That's about another month. Um, we're already a month past when we thought we would start. Uh, so that would be about a two-month delay. Um, and it is a, a late January meeting. Um, so it's I think it's the 23rd of January would be the next meeting. There's not one in the, the sooner. Right, but there's six of us. They, they are here tonight. <clears throat> I'm just putting it out there in the event that we don't come to an agreeable, movable item. We're in the same spot anyway. So I was just saying <clears throat> it's a pretty important item that the community feels deeply about. This council may or may not be um, unanimous on and just recognizing that and cutting through the smoke of all that. It's like it would be nice. I didn't know we were going to be one council member short. Um, if we had seven of us, I think it would be better because I think everybody has strong opinions about it. <clears throat> That's why I'm, I know it's not up to you, but. That, that's like we can, okay. Yeah. Thank you. <clears throat> Other comments or questions on this item? I'll, I'll make a, a quick comment. And, you know, something I didn't look at the screen. Uh, Council Member Tarosis. Thank you, Council Member Zwick. Uh, I would just say, I mean, the, the, the motion, as I understand it, from staff is for us to commence Sasaki on this work, and I'm, I'm not sure what what makes it necessary uh, or particularly controversial based on my reading of the staff report to wait. Um, seeing nobody else in the queue, I'll make a quick comment. This is of major importance to the people of Santa Monica. And um, in reviewing this this afternoon, it feels to me that we should have a full city council. The public deserves a full council in consideration of this item. So, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, I'm sitting too close to the vice mayor. Um, so, uh, I am, uh, I would, uh, like us also to postpone this until the next time we have a full city council because this is of importance to the city not only for the next year or five years but really for the next century. These are crucial moves and I believe the entire council needs to be present for this. Thank you. Any other comments? Seeing none, uh, do we need a roll call vote on this? Yes, we do. Okay. Council Member Zwick? Uh, no. Council Member Parra? Yes. Council Member Davis? No. Mayor Potem Negrete? Yes. Council Member Tarosis? No. And Mayor Brock? Yes. It's a 3 3 tie? It's a fail. <clears throat> and so we will still hear the item this evening. Thank you. So item six, public input on the remaining agenda items. Sorry. As your name is called by the clerk, can you line up against the east wall? So we have 20 speakers, seven speakers' names on the list. Jerry, I'm going to call the first five names. Jerry Rubin, Jonathan Foster, Denise Barton, Mark Verville, and Joanne Berlin. And as you speak, if you could please identify which items you're speaking on. And Mr. Yeah. Rubin, your name is listed twice. Are you speaking on two different items? Yes, correct. I am requesting uh, two minutes for 16D and two minutes for 11A, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. I'm uh, glad to uh, support 16D. And thank Council Members Zwick, Davis, and Tarosis for uh, putting on a ballot initiative, an advisory initiative that will increase a little bit of taxes to maximize our traffic safety. We talk about safety, we talk about crime, we talk about traffic safety is part of the concern we have to protect our citizens. I still remember when I was hit by a car. So. It's worth it very, very much. Uh, I take alternative transportation myself. I know people need a car, 
But I always figured you could, with good planning, maybe leave the car in the garage 10, 15, 20 percent of the time. And I still encourage people to do that. Won't have to think about parking then. But I think it's well worth it. And uh, I hope you support it. I think that's the two minutes for that item. And probably even less for 11A because I think this is an important issue, of course, like so many people in the city, we think uh, a park there is going to be the best use of that land. And naturally, there'll be other things there, art things, maybe some housing. Why not? It'd be good to have people living with the parks right outside their front door. <laughs> but mostly park, because the airport's always been a danger and pollution. and. I think we've already debated it for years and years. It seems to me like a lot of money to pay, but I appreciate the city manager and the choices and the decisions they're making. And it's obviously a good group that's worth the money that's going to be done. So I can't argue with that, even though uh, it seems like a lot of money. Anyhow. Um, I just want to thank you all again, and uh, I know the airport issue is an important issue, but I'm glad it's not being delayed. I mean, a lot of issues are important, and, you know, we all got to be here, and uh, obviously, uh, even if the council's divided, you know, I would hope that we're all in consensus. If it's that important an issue, it should be at least a 6-0 vote, but if it's not, you know, we're thinking it's not going to be. That's not a good enough reason to delay it. Anyhow, thank you. Thank you, Jerry. Our next speaker is Jonathan Foster. It's the time is still it's not my thing. Uh, do you guys remember when it was uh, Mayor McEwen? He was here. And so I was going to play this one for you. Good evening, I'm Mayor Pamela. Okay. Yes, thank you. <clears throat> and soon to be former mayor um, Davis, and I already told um, soon to be mayor Rock that um, after the year flies by quickly, he'll be initiated into the former mayor's club. Um, in closing, I want to say, you know, looking back on my time on the city council, I think one of the best um, motions I made was to nominate Gleam Davis to be selected as a city council. So, um, and she has proved me right. I always like it when you know, hey, I could. That was a good. Good vote. Um, you served us well, and the council will continue to on the council, and you've served us well as mayor. Well, I, I remember Susie Q, the mayor, had a, a word for you. She called you to uh, umbrage, or, or has umbrage for you, or something. I started calling you, in my mind, the umbrage mayor. And um, so I, I, I wasn't necessarily always happy with what I saw anybody do here, but um, I, I don't believe that you should have been able to be mayor because you never could get elected. And then Lana Negretti couldn't get elected either. How can you even be vice mayor? So I, 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 all of a sudden you got appointed and now you're, but you couldn't get elected. And then when there was an election, he, he and she had more votes than you did. So how can you become even vice mayor? Now I wanted to say to uh, Mr. Phil Brock, Mayor Phil Brock, I've grown to have a more respect for you. You are the only person that's come to my drum set. And do, you, do you know that has honored, uh, 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 um, made me honor you and have respect for you? So at some time, I will we'll speak with you, but uh, thank you. Our next speaker is Denise Barton. Good evening, and I am 16D. Does anyone else find it interesting that our city took down parking structure three and now wants to see if they can raise parking facilities tax? Would that make up for the losses? Um, and at this point, I would, would anyone vote for something proposed by council members Davis, Rosas, and Zwick? Since they do not have the best interests of the city, the residents, or business within it at heart. Other questions I have is how much will this increase parking rates in the structures? 
Again, I see this as nothing else but you trying to make up the lost parking revenue from parking structure three, which the city council voted to dis to demolish. And wasn't the safe routes to schools originally done with grant funding? If so, why is the city unable to continue the program with grant funding? And on the enhanced public safety through your actions of not having an ADA person in the city shows you do not care about the disabled or others mentioned. Thank you. Next speaker is Mark Furville. <coughs> I believe I have four minutes. Are you, I'm sorry, I don't see you listed twice. Are you speaking on two items? Uh, I believe I've been donated time. Okay. Who's your donating your time? Trisha Crane. Oh, okay, thank you. Thank you. Happy holidays, council members and honorable mayor. The direction to Sasaki, re the Santa Monica Airport, must be limited to a park. The draft direction says a park is only one of three scenarios. Obviously, development is anticipated to be a scenario. This simply cannot be allowed to happen. The residents have been told for a decade that an ultra-low density park is what is going to replace the ultra-low density airport. The city written LC was sold and passed solely on that basis. The city has never discussed development at the airport since they knew that the, that was in direct contravention of the park advocates' residents' demands and all the other residents' demands for an ultra low density land use. In that, the residents and voters were and are unanimous. Converting the airport to a Lincoln Boulevard development nightmare scenario is insane. The city has, fully, has a fully approved housing element that accommodates the entire unhinged and absurd six cycle RENA mandate of 8,895 units plus a buffer that I think takes it up to 13,000 units. Future housing mandates cannot be more than the six cycle eliminating any risk of additional housing requirements or new sites. And why is that? Since the start of the six cycle arena, the new state population projections have been released showing LA County's population declining to roughly 1990 levels by the year 2045 and to mid 1980s levels by the year 2060. This is a 2045 decline of 2.6 million people or 22% from what was assumed in the six cycle arena. And even then, these new projections are overstated. The city will need to audit the draft seven cycle numbers to ensure that they reflect the declining regional population and therefore ensure that Santa Monica is not abused again by the state. And why is that? The six cycle arena housing requirement assigned to Santa Monica was completely arbitrary, discretionary, and non-fact based in the extreme. The 2019 council completely failed to do their job and audit these absurd state unit numbers, simply accepting them at face value. They even left unchallenged abundant housing's completely fabricated and false numbers arguing for even more housing. This is a council failure that must be rectified in the seven cycle arena planning process. For all of these reasons, there must be absolutely zero development contemplated in the airport conversion plan. If this council does, does include development scenarios in the Sasaki contract, or if other development scenarios are allowed to proceed, then one that will message absolute disdain for all residents' clearly stated requirement for an ultra-low density land use at the airport site. The council cannot blame development on any state or other entity. This will be purely discretionary and a decision made by this council. It will expose the site and the city to unlimited development once the federal protection of an aviation facility is eliminated, which is of course the only true guarantor of an ultra-low density and low-cost use of the site. In this, I have no doubt that the development advocates will make an end run to the state to elicit their support just as Leonora Kamner and Abundant Housing did in 2019. It will also expose the supporters of such development to being firmly in the pocket of profiteering developers and investors that don't give a damn about the residents and use the city for their own profiteering purposes. And as far as needing more affordable housing, the housing element basically is approved at 6,168 affordable units. That's more than all of the uh, employees, the uh, teachers, fire, and police. The issue is not more affordable housing units that have to be approved. What it is, is how are we allocating those units, which is a black box and another thing that needs to be investigated by this council. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mark. Our next speaker is Joanne Berlin. And Ms. Berlin, before you get started, I'm gonna call five more names. Brad Ewing, Lauren Block, Robbie, Caro Villain and Diane Reynolds. Go ahead, Ms. Berlin. Okay, thank you. Um, 
I don't see it the way the former speaker, my predecessor speaker, sees it, of course. Um, I know that there are people in this city who are interested in, um, everybody's interested in having a park, I think. Um, but there are also people interested in seeing if there can be some kind of mixed housing situation included around some periphery areas, perhaps, or whatever. So that's, there are other opinions about what needs to be done in terms of the use of this over 200 acres of land. It's a lot of land. Um, so uh, I, I think that when the um, folks who are going to come in and do uh, this work uh, of making a recommendation to the City Council, I think they need to really um, listen to all members of the community and all ideas about what could be done with that much land. And I think that um, people who are concerned about um, the LC that was uh, voted in, um, that does contain uh, a, a section that says that all, you know, it, it, it's open. It's not just, it's not just a park. It's not just recreation. It's not just art. There are, there is a way to at least hear about doing some other things with that land. And it's, it's a scandal that people can't afford to live, who work here can't afford to live here. And there needs to be some real affordable housing, not what's called affordable housing, which is not affordable to most people who, um, a lot of people who work here and have to drive long distances to get here to work. It's, it's, it's a scandal, really. So I, I see it as a matter of justice, of hearing from all aspects of the community. Thank you, Ms. Berlin. Brad Ewing. My name is Brad Ewing. I'm going to speak on 11A, 16D, so let's go fast. So on 11A, I support awarding the contract to Sasaki Associates tonight. I support a comprehensive outreach process that engages the entire community. I believe it is imperative that council does not restrict the input that we get from residents during this outreach process. As part of that process, the community should be informed of the restraints that Measure LC put in place, that non-park uses have to go to a citywide vote, but note that it does not prohibit those uses from occurring if the residents want that. On 16D, I'd like to read a, letter to read a letter into the public record from Jeannie Schnittman, who could not be here tonight. Good evening, council members. Please say yes on this item to give the voters of Santa Monica the opportunity to improve the health and safety of those who live, work in, and visit our city, and to reduce greenhouse emissions at a time where the fossil fuel caused climate crisis is rapidly approaching catastrophic tipping points. This item directs staff to evaluate attacks on parking facilities to fund a set of transportation projects that would enhance the safety and usability of our streets for all users, including the young, the old, and those with various mobility challenges. Streets that are safe for our youngest and oldest users are streets that are safe for everyone. Whether they are getting around in private motor vehicles, which are the worst contributors to traffic congestion and greenhouse emissions, or by means that are better for the environment and for personal and public health, from public transportation to electric-powered and human-powered micromobility devices to walking. Next fall will mark for me four decades since moving across the country as a young adult to Santa Monica, the entirety of which I have lived car free. Contemplating the years ahead, I have to anticipate that the physical changes of later life may pose various challenges to getting around on foot, bicycle, and public transit. I hope that this, I hope that will be a city where thoughtful measures, including physical modifications to the street and sidewalk form, will make it safer as well as more convenient to go where I need and wish to day and night. The economic repercussions of the pandemic have strained the city's capacity to fulfill our Vision Zero goals. This proposed tax will provide the resources to enable us to get back on track, make Santa Monica a safer and healthier place for all. Thank you and happy holidays. Thank you, Brad. Next, Lauren Block. Uh, speaking to 11A, uh, I enthusiastically support 100 acres of parkland as the major and defining element on the airport property and think the city council ought to direct its staff and third party consultants to consider complementary land uses including housing for folks who work but can't afford to live here and a moderate amount of neighborhood serving retail and restaurants. 
The city spent close to $50 million to develop Tonga Park's two acres and will need to generate substantial revenue to support the construction and operation of future parkland on the 227-acre parcel. The Southern California Association of Governments is requiring the city to deliver substantial numbers of affordable and workforce housing. And as the city owns the land in question, there's a tremendous opportunity to deliver a mix of some residential that is, in fact, affordable to essential workers like our teachers, fire firefighters, and healthcare workers who generally can't afford Santa Monica area rents, let alone the opportunity to purchase a home of their own. If we prioritize the de delivery of affordable and workforce housing for people that already work in Santa Monica, it would help reduce commuter miles to and from work and traffic congestion in the city. If we make some housing available to those families who can document their historical displacement for the construction of the Civic Center and 10 Freeway, we can help heal the community's wounds. Additionally, many of our children have been priced out of the Santa Monica marketplace, and some of the land can be developed to provide them with housing they can afford. Our community needs families to grow in order to sustain demand for goods and services and the revenues they generate for the city's coffers. And housing and neighborhood services will help activate place neighborhood eyes on and secure the park's open spaces. The airport offers the city a once in a lifetime opportunity to master plan a significant public space in a way that truly serves its people. If we creatively plan for parkland that defines the site's character and integrates with complementary uses, we can deliver an exemplary and sustainable community that cares the city's historically. Thank you so much. Next, Robbie. Good evening. <clears throat> um, I want to say, first of all, I agree with the letter that was sent to you all by Hazard uh, Sinclair. Um, I mostly agree with, um, you know, letting Sasaki lead us through this uh, with the community outreach. However, I would like to see uh, multiple uses for the land. I would love to see multiple uh, living space for different folks. Um, I think that's very important. I realize we have a lot of development, a lot of housing, but we don't have a lot of low-income housing or affordable housing in the city, nor do we have uh, subsidized uh, home ownership, no motivation uh, to help folks get on their feet in the city. Um, we need more of that. Um, I know you guys know that, and you've heard from a lot of folks on a lot of different things, and I just believe that you will do the right thing right. As I always say, that's a big deal, that you do the right thing right. It's not about anything else but that. So, you know, we need housing for homeless and for unhoused, rather unhoused people and all multiple levels, including some market rate housing. I think that's a lot of acreage over there, and we can have little mini parks. We can have everything that has been mentioned here tonight, and I think you guys are the one to make sure that happens. So I thank you very much for it as a six over 60-year resident. Thank you. Thank you, Robbie. Next, we have Caro Verlaine. And Ms. Verlaine, I have you listed twice. Are you speaking on multiple items? Yes, 11A and 16D. We have four minutes. Thank you. Uh, I'll be quick about 11A because I'm not really prepared for it or very informed about it. But uh, I do realize that we're sitting on a very valuable asset with amazing potential. And considering the current climate and housing crisis that we're in, we need to give more people the opportunity to have access to housing in our city. We can't come here and complain about homelessness if we're not willing to build the things that will prevent people from falling into homelessness in the first place. So I really hope that we respect the process and value or the opportunities that we have with this land. For 16D, um, I came here to strongly support this item. Surprise. Um, I was trying to somewhat inform myself about this item yesterday, and I came upon the fact that SP Plus, which operates our par parking structures downtown, made $1.75 billion in revenue this year. And the idea here is to ensure that a small portion of their revenue is used to mitigate some of the harm that they strongly contribute to, such as congestion, pollution, safety issues, and frustration for all road users. I personally don't have the option to drive, and I never will. And even if I did, if I owned a car, I couldn't afford to live in Santa Monica right now. So I ride my bike through the city quite a bit, and I love it. 
But I also understand why fear is the number one reason why many people choose not to ride a bike. And honestly, some of the scariest encounters I've had while riding my bike here were with drivers trying to park downtown. They often get frustrated, impatient, and therefore oblivious to anyone outside of their living room on wheels. All this item is doing is asking to study the potential of such attacks. So if we're not willing to support it, I think many of us will question what, what our true intentions are here. You've all put a lot of work into being in the positions that you're in today. And I truly hope that you can learn to put some of your differences aside and use your power for the greater good, not just for our communities today, but also for future generations. These decisions are likely to affect them more than they will affect you or me or anyone in this room today. So considering the traffic violence and climate crisis that we are currently in, I really hope that you strongly support this item and many more that align with this vision in the future. Please don't fail us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next is Diane Reynolds. And Ms. Reynolds, before you uh, begin, I'm going to call five more names. Andrew Wilder, Joe Pertel, uh, Natalia Zernikskaya, Michael Brodsky, and Gavin SCO4. Let's go. Okay. You may get, begin, Ms. Reynolds. Good evening, Mayor Brock, Mayor Pro Tem Negretti, and Council Members. I'm Diane Reynolds, Chair of the Airport Commission, and I'm speaking on Item 11A on behalf of the Airport Commission. Ms. Reynolds, I'm sorry. Let me pause. You get five minutes. I'm not sure I need that entire time. Thank you. On December 11th, 2023, the Airport Commission unanimously passed 5 to 0 the following motion regarding Item 11A on the future of Santa Monica Airport. The Airport Commission recommends that the City Council hire Sasaki for the public outreach process and next steps for conversion of the airport into a great park. We also support the addition of a principal design and planning manager focused full time on the airport conversion project. Furthermore, we strongly recommend that the City Council direct staff and Sasaki to explore only land uses already approved under Measure LC that would not require a general election vote. Any other uses requiring a vote should only be considered once the airport has been closed on December 31st, 2028. I thank you all for your consideration and I wish you and your loved ones a restful and joyous holiday season. Thank you, Commissioner, for your service. Thank you. Andrew Wilder. Good evening. Uh, I'm speaking on 11A as well. My name is Andrew Wilder. I'm the vice chair of the Airport Commission, and I also voted for that motion you just heard. Uh, but I'm speaking personally right now. Um, I've read through the comments, uh, all 182 pages, I think it was, that were submitted for tonight's meeting. And what stood out to me is how unified the community is. It is a rousing chorus that includes the Recreation and Parks Commission, the Commission on Sustainability, Environmental Justice, and the Environment, the Airport Commission, Santa Monica Coalition for a Livable City, Northeast Neighbors, Friends of Sunset Park, a petition with over 360 signatures, dozens of individual letters, maybe 100, and of course the Santa Monica Airport to Park Foundation. What we are all saying is nearly the same thing. One, hire Sasaki tonight. Two, authorize a principal design and planning manager for this process to help shepherd it. Three, task Sasaki to come up with three design directions for our great park. And please, number four, for the love of all things holy, direct Sasaki to avoid triggering another ballot measure when doing so. Thank you very much and happy holidays. Thank you, Commissioner. Joe Pertel. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Joe Pertel. I'm also a member of the Airport Commission. Um, but I'm also speaking here on my own behalf. Um, I strongly support, of course, the recommendation to retain um, Sasaki Associates to convert the Santa Monica Airport back into a great park, and I think that's what's important. Uh, I also support staff's recommendation to hire a principal design uh, and planning manager to focus on, on the restoration of this park. Um, I ask you to please oppose any efforts this evening to trigger any sort of land use consideration prior to the closure of the airport. I strongly feel if you do that, you're gonna be playing right into the hands of aviation. They want us to have that ballot measure debate. They want us to be arguing over if you don't, if you don't do this, you're gonna end up with housing or you're gonna end up with Playa Vista. So please don't do that. There, there will be a time to consider those other uses, but it should not be at this point if you want to avoid uh, that type of battle. Um, I think tonight this this is one of the most important votes you could po probably take. This is uh, a vote about the future generations of, of our parklands. 
I, I cannot urge you strongly enough to support um, the retention of Sasaki and the restoration of a great park in our, in our community. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Patel. Natalia, Commissioner. I'm sorry. Thank you. No, no. Natalia Zernitskaya. Good evening, Mayor Brock, Mayor Pro Tem Negretti, and City Council members. I'm just like this because I was at my work holiday party. Um, I'm speaking tonight on items 11A and 16D. Um, in short, for 11A, I do support, um, I support choosing Sasaki. I was a little bit disappointed that we didn't move forward with Democratic lotteries, but I do hope that this public process will engage lots of voices that we don't normally get to hear from. Um, and I do completely understand the concern of not wanting to have a ballot measure prior to when the airport closes, but I do think the community who engages in this public process should understand what their options are and should it should be based in what the measure, the language of LC is. Additionally, I do appreciate that the staff report for 11A calls out that an additional staff person will be needed to help implement this community vision for a great park and cultural uses and arts and educational uses and if there's something else that the community feels very strongly about. Um, it will be costly to create this great park um, on the land, so we should consider how it can be self-sustaining. What uses can we put there that are both within um, Measure LC and potentially desired by the community that could bring in funds that can help pay for the park. On um, item 16D, I support it, but as I mentioned in my uh, email this afternoon, I do hope that the, um, that the research by the city manager and the city attorney will include more than just a general tax measure and we'll look at how else we could raise funds to pay for safety and improvements across the city. Thank you very much and happy holidays and happy birthday. <laughs> Thank you, Natalia. Uh, Michael Brodsky. And Mr. Brodsky, I have you listed twice. Are you speaking on two items? Two items. Okay, then you have four minutes. Great. Um, thank you very much. I'm Michael Brodsky. I'm on the board of the Santa Monica Airport to Park Foundation, and I'm speaking on 11A. And this is exciting to be here because we are now moving into the real process of creating a space for the future of residents of Santa Monica and the neighboring areas for generations and generations and generations and generations to come. And that those generations will require a great park. And so we support um, Sazaki's uh, selection of Sazaki uh, Design Associates. I've seen what they we've seen what they've done in uh, places like uh, Baton Rouge and all around the world. And uh, I think they could help lead the public outreach and the design process. We support the need for a, a staff member uh, to uh, help run this process, and we above all support. Um, measure LC and the creation of a great park that will provide for open space, recreation use, and park use uh, within the means of Measure LC. So uh, we're looking forward to that. Uh, changing hats here to myself as just an individual, um, speaking on Measure 16D, um, street safety is a paramount importance to me. I lost my grandfather on Wilshire and 10th. And so I really support any process that will provide funds to create safe routes to schools, to create safe routes to parks, and to allow uh, people from 8 to 80 to navigate our streets so kids can go from their home to school to the playground safely, and seniors like myself can go from home to city council safely. So thank you for considering both of these uh, issues. I appreciate it. Bye-bye. Thank you so much, Michael. Gavin Scoff and Mr. Uh, Scoff, before you start, I'm going to name a uh, call for a few more names. Zena Josephs, Kathy Knight, Austin Washington, Alan Levinson, and John C. Smith. Uh, first of all, Councillors, I have to express my distress, and I think the distress that many will feel that you are considering 11A, the uh, future of the airport to park land. 
without a full council. It seems to me profoundly undemocratic that one member should not be allowed to vote for technical reasons that none of the public properly understand. So I, I'm sorry to introduce that dark note into the proceedings, but it is, I believe, a shocking decision, especially in the context of the fact that what the proposal is at present to us, Sasaki, to look at the future of this land without taking into account the fact that the vast majority of the people of Santa Monica less than 10 years ago said that the airport, when it closes, should become a park, Measure LC. The only fair thing to do to honor that democratic decision that the people of this city made is to ask Sasaki to conduct their activities in the light of that decision, Measure LC, which is that this land should be a park. It was bought as a park. We lent it to the federal government. We have finally got it back. We made the decision that it should return to the park from which we bought it. We should stick to that. It is a green oasis. It has the potential after 80 years of being covered in asphalt and concrete to return to what it was bought as, what we will increasingly need and what generations to come. Think of it generations to come, you will never get this potential for green open space back. Do not rob the children of this city and the children around this city of the possibility of having a park. The promises of affordable housing, if you let developers in, are false promises. There is too much money to be made. People are greedy. We all know that the promise of affordable housing doesn't happen. Please go for the park. Tell society. Thank you very much, Gavin. Thank you. Nina Josephs. Thank you. Uh, the Friends of Sunset Park Board urges you to direct Sasaki Associates to avoid any land uses in any scenario that would require a ballot measure before Santa Monica Airport closes. Ballot measure LC said if the airport land is permanently closed to aviation, no new development of the land shall be allowed until the voters have approved limits on uses and development. However, this does not prohibit the City Council from approving parks, public open spaces, public recreational facilities, and the maintenance and replacement of existing cultural arts and education uses. Another ballot measure before 2029 could begin a renewed battle over the future of the airport, possibly involving the National Business Aviation Association, the Aircraft Owners and Pilots Association, which spent nearly a million dollars in 2014 to defeat Measure LC. It could push the closure and conversion timeline beyond January 2029 and further delay public access to parkland that the city purchased with a park bond. Uses that are not allowed by Measure LC could be explored later on after the airport closes and after a basic park plan is in place. We also support hiring a principal design and planning manager focused on a great park. Santa Monica had a great park on what is now the airport land from 1927 to 1941. It included playgrounds, tennis courts, playing fields, horseshoes, lawn bowling, an archery range, a shooting range, a recreation center, an 18-hole golf course, and picnic grounds. So our goal is to bring back our park. My husband grew up in New York City neighborhood in Queens with 20,000 residents and a 500-acre park. So a 200-acre park for 90,000 residents is certainly not unreasonable. Thank you. Thank you, Zena. Next, we have Kathy Knight. And Ms. Knight, I have you listed twice. Are you speaking on two items? No, just one. Okay. You have two minutes. Uh, just 11A. Um, yes, good evening, uh, Mayor Brock and City Council members. Um, I'm asking that you make sure that Sasaki Associates knows that we want them to focus on the park and there should be um, no housing development on this rare and precious park space. What we need are natural areas where people, especially children, can get out and enjoy walking and connecting to nature there. Areas like this help people to relax and feel good and provide habitat for local wildlife. Measure LC, as you've heard, approved in 2014 by 60% of the Santa Monica voters, prohibits new development of airport land after all or part of the airport is permanently closed until the voters have approved limits on the uses and development that may occur on the land. Um, and after putting up for decades 
with both the noise and pollution of daily flights out of the airport and with unleaded fuel, residents close to the airport deserve the nurture of nature in a park and for future generations in their neighborhood. And we can also plant a lot of trees there. That would be good. Um, please help us make sure that Sasaki Associates pays strong attention to public input <clears throat> and is totally transparent in their work on this issue. Thank you for your attention to this very important issue. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. Austin, Washington. And Mr. Washington, I have you listed twice. Are you speaking on two items? Uh, yes, but I'll make it relatively brief. Um, let's see, I got my time. All right. Um, do you have something a little written here? Um, in support of, I believe it's 16D, um, I like the idea of adding a tax on parking as it Parking in a downtown area can sort of stick out like a sore thumb sometimes. We're kind of lucky in Santa Monica, it doesn't as much. And I love the idea of directing these funds to safe streets. Um, I love my city. I love seeing my city being recognized as pedestrian forward um, in, you know, TikTok videos, articles, everything. Um, Santa Monica is and could continue to exponentially increase their influence on other cities in the area to be more friendly and more of a haven towards pedestrians. I like the, the idea of the tax on uh, parking structures, and I wonder if, and this is just me floating ideas, being very aggressive here, we could potentially do something like shrinking the 90-minute free grace period or doing something else to generate even a tiny bit more revenue for safer streets, as I believe, you know, VO has become a, a form of transit for kids my age, biking, skateboarding, everything, and I feel that the city should be doing all that it can um, to promote that. Um, on 11A, I'm relatively uneducated on the subject, but I do very much like the idea of converting the airport to parks, and I believe in fitting with the needs of our city in this, uh, in, 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 you know, with the U.S. in general in a housing crisis, of potentially adding affordable housing. I understand, and I have learned just, just recently, recently being five minutes ago, that um, it was originally proposed as just, um, as just a park space. However, I believe that we sort of need to pivot to the needs of, you know, a growing city. Um, I wonder, and this is probably already um, answered, but I'm not sure how Clover Park um, would be, you know, would be tied in as I love that park. I went there, you know, with my school for PE last year, almost, you know, two times a week. And it was amazing, but the airport was always a pain. So I really do like the idea of potentially expanding or, you know, adding, adding more park space. Um, and with the affordable housing, I always wanted to, you know, move uh, move back to Santa Monica if I, you know, made it, because I, I do music, I do drum space. Um, if I were to, like, make it in the music industry, sort of be very successful and move to Santa Monica, but with, you know, more affordable housing and pivoting to the needs of a city, I'd want to uh, consider moving here even just to work in the industry in L.A. Um, to use a self-promotion, but I am in a band and we're performing on January 18th at the Mint. Um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, that's what all I have to say. I have time, but yeah, we're called Serotonin. We're pretty cool. Um, Thank you, sir. <laughs> Next is Alan Levinson. And before Mr. Al uh, Levinson begins, I'm going to call the last names. Uh, John Smith, Connor Webb, and Phoebe, I'm sorry, Ke Kehofer? You can go ahead, Mr. Levinson. There's, there's supposed to be a, uh, a thing put up. A map I sent to the clerk and they said it would be available All right, I to be put on the screen. Aware of that. Can you just give me a second to see? Where's Oscar? While I'm here, I'd like to say again, where's Oscar? He wanted to be here tonight and he was kicked off. I see a three and three people. Has my time started? Oh, the map's up. Thank you. That's uh, Alan Levinson. That's the map of... Santa Monica Airport with all the different pieces of land. Everyone talks about 200 acres. The, the runway itself is about 60 acres. Surrounding the runway are a bunch of buildings. Sasaki is a great design firm. They could repurpose those buildings into other things very cheaply. Yes, we need housing for, for people that don't have a lot of money in Santa Monica. My kids can't live here. I understand that. But this is the only big piece of land that we have in Santa Monica. Don't mess with it. Please don't mess with it. I see a stalemate coming. Right here. We're told we're NIMBYs. We're a small group. We're an annoying little group of people. 
5,368 people, 1926, voted for a park. 15,434 people, 2014, a park. 370 residents sent items for you guys to read. I'm sure nobody read them. 370 here. Written comments, as, as was said before, predominantly for a park. Yes, nobody's ever going to agree on what we should do with that land, but that's the only parkland we have. You guys have an opportunity to mess with it, and once you start, it's over. Please direct Sasaki to build the park, not a little bit of this and a little bit of that and put houses here. There's land to put houses. You don't need acres and acres to put low-income housing. You've had years and years to build low-income housing. We have. Please, don't blow it tonight. Please don't blow it tonight. Everyone's walking, watching, and where's Oscar? Thank you. Thank you, Alan. John Smith. And Mr. Smith, I have a note that you're speaking on behalf of the Recreation and Parks Commission. That's correct. Uh, three minutes for the, on behalf of the commission. Okay. And then I ask for two minutes for myself. So you get five minutes. <laughs> All right. Let me know. Go Good evening, Council, Mayor Brock, Councilors, Mr. White, everyone. Um, I'm John C. Smith, a nine-year member of the Santa Monica Recreation and Parks Commission. Um, I have two things to say tonight. Um, one, I want to summarize quickly this letter from the, the Recreation and Parks Commission to you, dated from October, about our recommendations about this process. And then uh, I want to give you my two cents. So first off, the letter, there's several points. I hope that you guys have seen it, you've read it, you've looked at it. Um, bottom line is we decided we wanted to, you know, the commission voted unanimously to thank you. The 4-3 vote back in October that rejected that so-called healthy democracy process. A little bit more on that in a minute. We also appreciate the council asking staff to work with Sasaki to come up with a good community involved process that involves all the partners and stakeholders and residents. Um, we, um, we also ask that the council affirm and recognize the community's understanding of Measure LC as the guiding assumption and frame of reference for this community engagement work. We also ask that uh, a member of the Recreation and Parks serve on any advisory board that you decide to create. And finally, that um, you give us a chance, the Recreation and Parks Commission, give us a chance to vet some of these proposals before they go to you. That's why we're here. We're here to help. And if you want good recommendations, it's got to come to us first. It doesn't always happen that way. So thank you. Now I want just two minutes on myself. You guys, the people that say there should be housing at the airport, that somehow it's going to be a miracle and all this affordable housing is going to help you know, solve our homelessness problem, are being disingenuous. 89% of the buildings, of the units that are going up in California are our highest market rate. We're, we're left with about 11% of affordable housing statewide. Um, I was one of the people that was here until 3, 3.30 a.m. the night you guys, four of you, uh, the mayor, the now mayor, Ms. Ms. Para, Ms. Negretti, and uh, Oscar voted down that proposal. And it was a good thing because that proposal was neither healthy nor was it democracy. It was kind of a veiled attempt to sort of circumvent this whole process. We saw through it, and thank God four of you did as well. And I really, you know, that's why I, th I thank you. In closing, look at no more charades. Three of you tonight voted not to delay this process. But imagine what a whole new ballot measure would do, how much delay that would cause. Um, no more games. Let LC be our guide, and let's get to work on an airport to park. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Smith. Next is Connor Webb. Thank you. 
Good evening. My name is Connor Webb. Uh, I am here to speak uh, in favor of 16D. Um, just wanted to mention that parking is already heavily subsidized in the U.S. Um, estimates place between 100 to 300 billion dollars a year uh, spent on subsidies to parking, um, and it will be continue. It, it will continue to be subsidized after this. You know, with the uh, 90 minutes of free parking, business goers will have plenty of time to uh, do their business downtown. And I think a small tax is is, is not too much to ask for. Uh, ensuring the safety of other road users. Um, you know, pedestrian safety is not a privilege. Uh, I was I was actually a little late today because uh, I was I was hit by a driver on the Sixth Street uh, bike lane as they pulled into the bike lane um, on my way here. Um, you know, I, I brought this up to show you what I was wearing. It's clearly not uh, a visibility issue. Um, we need more measures of safety here. And. Uh, you know, our children and elderly, they deserve to have an opportunity to move through the city feeling safe and secure. Um, you know, there's no worse time to be stuck in the backseat of a car uh, than when you're developing and learning how to move, move through the world and uh, function as a member of society. Um, you know, whether we're walking, rolling, taking the bus, or driving, we need, San we need a Santa Monica where every mode of transportation is accommodated um, and individuals of all ages and abilities uh, feel secure through a combination of accessible infrastructure and improved safety education and enforcement. Um, I've said it before uh, to, this, to this council, but uh, we need to send the message that we are serious about creating a safe, sustainable, and livable community. Because um, ultimately, it, it creates an environment where the residents, the businesses, and the visitors can all thrive together. So um, I hope, I hope uh, we continue to see uh, you all take safety seriously in Santa Monica, and that we can see further improvements on this. And this tax will go towards that. So thank you very much. Thank you, Connor. And the last speaker tonight is Phoebe Keekhofer. Sorry. Yeah, you said it right. Thank you. Hello. Um, thank you all for having me tonight and for um, giving me the chance to speak. Um, I'm here in favor of item 16D. I'm, a, I'm Santa Monica born and raised. I'm a proud alum of Franklin Elementary, Lincoln Middle, and Santa Monica High School. I never needed a car to get to school because I could walk, roll, take the bus, um, and that was really awesome. However, this is not as much of an option for current SMMUSA students because of the intense uh, big blue bus service cuts that happened during the COVID-19 pandemic, um, which has still not been restored to reflect the reopening of schools and businesses alike. We desperately need to be able to fund um, and restore uh, big blue bus service to provide SMM USC students the same opportunities that I and my colleagues enjoyed growing up. Um, we are facing an amazing opportunity to do this because, um, as we know, downtown Santa Monica parking structures have generated $1.75 billion in revenue in the last year. And we have an amazing opportunity to use these funds to make Santa Monica streets safer and more enjoyable for everyone. One such example being fully funding and restoring uh, big blue bus service. Given our epidemic of vehicular violence, the fact that so many Santa Monica residents still don't feel that it's a viable option to get around without a car in our impending climate crisis, we are in a desperate position to make alternative transportation um, a reliable, abundant, and efficient choice for Santa Monica residents, especially our SMMUSD youth. Um, our youth deserve the ability to get to school safely and reliably, reliably without a car. We still have not reflected this in our local transit um, to reflect what the community desperately needs. I sincerely hope you move forward with this opportunity to fund and promote alter alternative transportation options. Santa Monica cannot leave car dependency behind and fully have safe streets without vigorously investing in alternative transportation methods. And taxing our parking facilities is the perfect opportunity to invest, to invest in the safety of our city. Please do not fail us here. Please do not fail the youth of Santa Monica. Thank you. Thank you, Phoebe. And that is the last speaker tonight. Thank you very much, Clerk. Um, so let's move on to ordinances. And our first ordinance. Ordinances. Public comment is permitted on ordinances for introduction and first reading. No public discussion is permitted on ordinances for second reading and adoption. In accordance with Charter Section 615, the adoption of all ordinances and resolutions shall be by reading of the title only unless a council member present dissents. Item 10A, introduction and adoption of emergency interim zoning ordinance authorizing establishment by resolution of objective design standards for qualifying housing projects that elect to use the streamlined ministerial approval process established by Senate Bill 35 and adoption of resolution establishing objective design standards for qualifying housing projects that elect to use the streamlined ministerial approval process established by Senate Bill 35.
Oh, there we go. Okay. Good evening, Council. Um, Jing Yo, Planning Manager. Um, I'll be presenting this tonight with um, Steph Stephanie Reich, our Design and Historic Preservation Planner. Um, this is an IZO to um, put in place objective design standards um, in the scenario that somebody files an SB35 housing project. Um, so we'll be giving an overview of what SB35 is, um, how HCD came to that determination, and then review for you the proposed um, objective design standards. <clears throat> So what is SB 35? Um, it's um, a bill that was passed as part of the 2017 housing package, and it was most recently amended um, in this current uh, 2023 legislative session by Senate Bill 423. Um, key changes were that it changed some applicability of the labor uh, requirements um, in the bill. It extended the applicability of this, of this to 2036. It was meant to actually sunset um, in 2025. Um, and it also applies it to the coastal zone. Um, so what it is, is it creates a ministerial approval process, so that means no public hearing, um, for qualifying housing projects in cities that don't meet their state mandates for housing production. So um, if you recall during the housing element uh, discussions, you know, we said this is um, the one state law that actually uh, creates a penalty if a city does not actually build housing. A housing element doesn't actually require us to build, it just requires us to plan. But this bill is actually the one penalty that um, creates uh, for, for, for cities that don't issue enough building permits for housing. Uh, I want to note that it is a process that is not automatic. Applicants must opt into it. Um, and it also says design review must be only done through objective design standards. So that's why we're here today. Um, how do you get on this list uh, to be subject to SB 35? It is a determination by the Department of Housing and Community Development um, every year, and it applies to cities that don't meet their um, housing mandates or their arena goals for above moderate and lower income housing. So it's just those two categories. It's just above moderate, so basically market rate housing, and lower income housing. So that counts very low and low income. Um, building permits. It also applies to cities that don't have a compliant housing element or if you fail to submit what's called your annual progress report. So for this year on June 30th, HED determined that Santa Monica, we met our market rate um, production, but we fell short on the affordable unit production. And therefore, Santa Monica is currently subject to SB 35 for housing projects that, in can, that include at least 50% affordable units. That means that if an applicant pro, uh, proposes a project with at least 50% affordable units, they could opt in to this um, SB 35 ministerial approval process. Um, this is just more detail as to how HCD came to that determination. So it's, it's a little wonky, but we'll try and simplify this here, is that the determination is, is actually based at two points in time. They look at halfway through your housing element cycle, and then they look at the end of it. So it's called the prorated RENA, which is the halfway point, or the RENA, which is the end of it. So the current determination is actually based on the end of the fifth cycle, the prior housing element cycle. So they base it on two factors, whether your annual progress report has been submitted. This is the statewide requirement for every city, every April 1, to have submitted your annual progress report. That's the report on many, many things, including how many building permits did you issue for housing projects at all income categories. And then the second question is, you know, did you make sufficient progress towards your arena? So this determination that's been made now, it will not change until the midpoint of the six cycle arena, which is 2025. You can see this graphic is from the HTD website here. It shows um, how we did um, on the prior cycle, um, again, which is going to carry through the midpoint um, of the six cycle arena. So you can see there that, you know, we didn't quite make 100% or more than that for um, our very low and low income, but you can see for above moderate income, um, 1,753 permits issued compared to, you know, 700 that were allocated for that category. Um, this is just to show a comparison between uh, Santa Monica's uh, approval process for housing um, that involves no public hearing and SB 35. Um, this table just, you know, it, it's they, they are fairly similar um, in terms of the process. I think the city's, uh, uh, the, the, the big difference is that the city doesn't have sort of um, some preconditions that SB 35 has. So you can see some differences there in terms of the allowance of commercial. SB 35 allows, you know, 33% commercial. Santa Monica's streamlined process requires that no more than the project include 25% commercial. 
We require the 15% on site per our inclusionary housing program, uh, and it has to be consistent with the zoning ordinance. As I indicated, this SB 35 process is only available to projects that include at least 50% low income um, uh, uh, affordable housing on, in their projects. SB 35 has no limit on the size of the site um, that uh, it could apply to a project. Um, Santa Monica's local streamline process has that threshold of one acre um, you know, before a public hearing is required. Um, you can see on the left there sort of these environmental site limitations. Uh, many of them don't really apply um, to Santa Monica. Um, you know, we do not have um, wetlands or farmland, for example. Um, neither of them can demolish a historic structure. And then this is really, I think, the biggest one that we've heard from housing providers that sort of has um, made SB 35, you know, maybe not viable for them to pursue is these um, prevailing wage and labor requirements. Um, you can see there that, you know, for projects that are both 11 units and on public work, there's a prevailing wage requirement. And then over 85 feet skilled and trained workforce um, is required. And we have heard feedback from housing providers that these requirements are fairly onerous and say they sort of don't, you know, make, makes SB 35 maybe less attractive compared to the regular city process. Um, and then there's uh, obviously tenant protection. So under local law, we just, you know, follow state law in terms of SB 330 that establishes uh, required replacement, um, removal of any protected units, you know, among other things includes things like if they're existing rent controlled units, if they've been Ellis in the last 10 years, you know, they would be covered by that. Um, under SB 35, um, you actually cannot use the process at all if the project is demolishing units that are occupied by tenants within the last 10 years, subject to an affordable deed restriction or any form of local rent or price control. Um, that's just kind of an overview of how it got to this point. I guess looking ahead, um, you know, if it's of interest, you know, like I said, um, they, that determination is, you know, kind of st stuck in place until the midpoint of the sixth cycle. You can see that this is really what's in the pipeline right now as of last month. Um, we are doing very, very well um, in terms of uh, above moderate pending. So you can see approved pending and in construction. We are about, you know, 2,000 units over our allocation. Um, but, uh, you know, obviously um, uh, behind on the very low and low income and moderate uh, categories. And you can see that final column there is, you know, sort of the units um, still uh, where we're still short um, in terms of that very low, low and moderate income category. Um, so I think just to explain what does SB 35 mean for design review, I think there's sort of been maybe some misunderstanding about, you know, design review is disappearing from Santa Monica, you know, in the way that you know it with the ARV, that is not the case. Um, again, this, this process is an opt-in process, applies to only housing projects with at least 50% affordable units that choose to file an SB 35 application and in those, those kinds of projects, um, design review is only done through objective design standards. However, all the existing zoning standards still apply, so they still must comply with our zoning code. For other kinds of projects that are not, you know, these, these more than 50% affordable projects, they are still subject to the city's existing review procedures um, for design review, which, you know, may include um, the ARB's review, depending on the scale of the project. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Stephanie now um, to run through the proposed objective design standards. Thank you, Jing. Um, good evening, council members, mayor, Stephanie Reich, design and historic preservation planner to take you through the proposed SB 35 objective design standards. So um, as Jing mentioned, uh, these are the key considerations uh, for um, for our SB 35 objective design standards, that uh, we didn't replace any existing zoning standards. We're uh, adding to those zoning standards. We already have many uh, design standards within our zoning code, uh, as many of you know, and these are filling in some of the gaps, uh, and we'll take you through that. Uh, we are very clear and have been very clear with our boards and commissions and members of the public uh, that we will not want to constrain housing production or add cost to housing production. And our public members and commission and board members helped us uh, hone the standards so that they will not uh, add cost uh, to, to the projects. 
uh, and that the standards are within the scope of design review. Um, and so, as Jing mentioned, uh, these uh, these would apply to uh, opt-in SB 35 projects that are at least 50 percent affordable, so a very small percentage of the projects that we review. Um, and we've organized standards into certain categories. So uh, one of the categories that uh, we already have many standards for most of our projects are with uh, the ground floor uh, where the pedestrian interfaces with a project, uh, entrances and other elements. Um, we spend a lot of time in design review looking at facades of the building, making sure there's sufficient transparency, not only on the ground floor, but throughout the building for uh, visual interest, uh, open space, landscaping and social space, uh, for not only design of the project, but quality of life. Uh, and we may, with the new uh, zoning standards, the implementation of the housing element, we may start to see structured parking uh, uh, above ground. And so screening that, we haven't seen that before uh, or haven't seen it lately. And so screening that becomes uh, really imperative for high quality design. Um, and so uh, here are some of the uh, overall intents that we were working with. Um, we anticipate and the code requires a mix of street facing commercial and residential uses uh, for a vibrant uh, ground floor pedestrian environment. Uh, that design element should also foster uh, an engaging pedestrian experience. Uh, visual interest on the ground floor, which does engage the pedestrian and has a sense of transparency and liveliness on the ground floor. Uh, and uh, these, uh, these standards really make way for the new allowance for ground floor residential uses. Uh, previously, we weren't seeing residential units on the boulevards or, or on many of the streets in the mixed use projects. Uh, but we now will, uh, we are now beginning to see residential uses on the ground floor as well. Uh, and so uh, to take you through some of the standards, uh, at the ground floor, um, we had previously had a limitation on the height of the ground floor. Uh, this has been uh, relaxed due to a fair amount of concern from the development community and architects that were having challenges to get uh, a variety of uses into the ground floor. And so for, uh, for buildings that have a ground floor that are 15 feet or higher, a horizontal element, let's see if I can work, work this. Let's see. Nope. Um, trying to get to the get to show you when I'm talking yes there we go um, so um, when we talk about horizontal elements we're talking about awnings and other elements uh, window treatments and so forth that will bring uh, bring the building bring the ground floor down to the scale of the pedestrian if it's an over height ground floor um, and so those don't need to be uh, continuous. There's a minimum of 30% of the building frontage. That provides flexibility for a wide variety of design. That was one of the principles that we, uh, we were working with, that we want these to be standards so that as we review them, there's a yes or no answer. But uh, architects and de the development community have a range of different options to satisfy those standards. Um, for commercial entrances or non-residential entrances, uh, we want them to be art also articulated. Uh, we, ent we always want a, a logical place for the signage to go. So a lot of these standards uh, that you'll see, including this one, are really uh, making a standard of something that we will naturally see from the development community. The, the development community wants uh, signage on their commercial units. This uh, provides a standard that would make a place for that and also highlight entries and provide that pedestrian-oriented ex experience. 
Um, for residential unit entries, as I mentioned, the new standards uh, that implement the housing element allow residential uses in places where we hadn't previously seen residential on the ground floor. Therefore, the zoning code doesn't have uh, design standards embedded within it already for residential units on the, on the boulevards. And so here are some standards for design elements that will make that a lively experience for the pedestrian. So uh, minimum three foot covered landing area so that you articulate the entry as well as provide protection for unique days like we have today where there is precipitation falling from the sky. What a unique idea. Um, in, and include three of the list of uh, the following. So not all of them, but uh, three of them recessed entry, overhead projection, side light windows, up or down stair, or differentiated paving. Um, uh, we, uh, we talked at great length with our members of the public and boards and commission members, particularly about the stair. That is not a requirement. Uh, there is also a requirement for, uh, for accessibility into all of our units. This is not contradictory to that, that's a very important accessibility and sustainability are important principles that all of these guidelines and standards dovetail with. Um, so in, in projects, what we have heard from our affordable housing developers, uh, that there is a preference for a single primary entry rather than having separate residential entries if residential is on the ground floor. And that enables, uh, that enables more safety for the residents and a little bit, uh, better management and watchful eye about what happens on the ground floor. And so, um, so what, uh, what we're asking for is a residential lobby or a, uh, or an amenity space to provide some activity, uh, some visibility into the ground floor for that pedestrian experience. Um, so for the facade standards, uh, we, we are, uh, including, uh, a minimum of transparency, a percentage of transparency for the overall facade, uh, requirements for windows that they be recessed at least two inches or have some kind of treatment around, around them. This allows for a play of light and shadow across the facade, which adds to the visual interest and the level of quality of the facade. Uh, this is uh, a detail that we talked about at great length with members of the public and the architectural review board to make sure that this was not adding cost uh, or unnecessary cost to, to the standards. Um, and uh, also, we're asking for when there are changes in material occur, that transitions happen in certain places so that there's still a design sense. Uh, from what, what I'm told, when people come to Santa Monica, they notice a real difference between Santa Monica and the city of Los Angeles. And our design review process has a great deal to do with that. And these standards that we're putting in place will maintain that high quality uh, for the city of Santa Monica. Um, and so uh, we also have included uh, design standards, as I mentioned, for open space, uh, facades, and parking. So uh, we, we are asking for uh, the intent is for a variety of open space for livability. And there's a really wonderful history in Santa Monica of courtyard housing and those spaces providing uh, a glue, a social space for the building community that radiates outward to the neighborhood and then to the whole community. And so we're, uh, we're uh, putting, we're offering standards that would enable that kind of social space rather than sometimes what we see is uh, these outdoor spaces filled with landscaping and used as circulation paths only. So we're putting in place requirements so that they are amenity spaces as well so that they can become that kind of social heart of the building. Um, uh, so facades to, uh, to ensure that there's uh, a number of architectural elements, materials, and features, and uh, to screen uh, parking so that it is well integrated into the building so that 
If we have parking on certain floors of the building, uh, it looks like a single holistic design. Um, we're asking for, uh, uh, as part of our open space experience, we are asking that uh, roof decks, if they are adjacent to re other, other residential zones, that they be set back so that there can be a, a sense of quiet in those uh, lower density residential zones, or at least respect that sense of quiet, and that um, for, uh, for affordable housing projects, there is an opportunity to put the private open space together with the common open space so that balconies aren't requir required. So on projects where there are no balconies, uh, no actual physical balconies that you could walk out on, uh, we are offering a standard that would require uh, at least 50% of the units to have what's called a Juliet balcony, uh, which would be defined as uh, glazing going to the ground uh, with, uh, with a railing that prevents you from falling. And th the example, oops, uh, I'm not uh, so skilled at this. So one e the example viewed is uh, right here where you've got the floor to ceiling uh, window treatment and you can open that window all the way and uh, stand not outside of the unit but have the light and air come into the unit as if you were outside. Um, so for common space, common open space, um, as, uh, as I mentioned, uh, we're uh, introducing some standards that are a little bit finer grained to ensure that these can become the social heart of the building um, so that we would have a minimum of landscaping, uh, that there would be a minimum of, a, of one tree per 500 square feet. That softens the experience to provide some shade. Uh, that there would be a requirement for seating and one of a variety of amenities, water features, play space, furniture, et cetera, and a, uh, a minimum amount of seating so that uh, it, it enables people to actually go into the social space and, uh, and have, have that kind of interaction with one another. Um, and so, uh, we, we're asking for a minimum of one social space uh, for, e for every 25 units with a minimum dimension. So if you imagine uh, an outdoor room that's a minimum of 10 feet wide by 10 feet wide, which is the size of a small bedroom, um, or maybe my bedroom for most of my life, um, uh, that would be provided for uh, every 25 units and that each of those spo social spaces would have one of uh, that uh, variety of, of uh, amenities, cooking facilities, edible gardens, a pool or a spa, a water feature, exercise equipment, uh, play space or play, play equipment. We find particularly for our affordable housing providers, uh, play space, play equipment is one of the requirements for their funding. So we, we will see a lot of these amenities naturally, uh, and we have seen them, uh, many of them, uh, without asking for them. This puts them in the code. We don't believe they add cost to the development. Um, for parking uh, and uh, the entrances to the parking and screening of parking as part of the building, uh, on the lower left, you see where there are no requirements, uh, what that might look like. And on the right, uh, on the lower right, that's an entrance that has uh, a materiality that works well with the building and, full, and wraps the corner so that uh, as you enter, as you enter into your parking structure, which is for many of us the way we enter into our buildings, it, it is still a nice experience. It's a nice experience for members of the public looking at it, and it's a good experience for the residents. Uh, the photo up above is uh, in Culver City. That's a ground floor commercial with parking above, and that, that 
is an example of a, a fully integrated design with parking that's well screened. And that's the kind of thing we're going for. We anticipate the standards that we've written will develop into this kind of example. Uh, and so um, we uh, ask that you make a recommendation of no significant impact, according to CEQA, uh, introduce and adopt the emergency interim zoning ordinance, and adopt the resolution establishing objective design standards for qualifying SB 35 housing projects. And of course, we're here for any questions. Thank you so much. We are open for questions, and I see Council Member Davis in the queue as number one. All right, thank you, Ms. Reich and Missy. Yeah, um, so I, I have one question. Do we have to even allow above ground parking? Uh, the answer to that is yes. Um, our, and it's not a bad thing uh, if it's properly screened. Um, I have, I mean, just personally, I've yet to see any above ground parking that I look at and go, Boy, that's well screened parking. That looks good. I mean, it, I, I, it's, I mean, that's my question is if we're required to do it, then yes, it should be well screened. But I guess under SB 35, are we required to allow above ground parking and how much? Um, that's not triggered by SB 35. It is really a function of, uh, the current, what we're, what we're currently seeing, uh, as a function of, the current zoning standards. Um, so the, 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 the FAR that's being allowed, the heights that, that are being allowed enable for the, for the first time in some time, enable the parking to be above ground and still pencil out because previously, uh, previously developers were using all of that territory for residential units and putting any parking below ground. Below ground parking is very expensive. And if they don't need to use all that, all that area for units, they will put some parking there. <coughs> yes, sorry. Um, I, I also want to clarify that if it is an SB 35 project, you, they are only required to comply with the city's zoning ordinance, like any objective standards, the city's standards, we, we don't prohibit above ground parking. It is unusual, um, you know, simply for the fact that um, if you do above ground parking, it's considered floor area, you know, per the city zoning ordinance. However, through the use of state density bonus law and the like, right, it's sort of allowed, um, you know, mo modifications of standards, if you will, that sort of make it a reality um, to have above ground parking. And, you know, as Stephanie indicated, it is cheaper to build um, than, than subterranean parking. So we are seeing in our more sort of recent proposals, you know, that above ground parking. But to short answer your question, our zoning code does not prohibit above ground parking. Could our zoning go code prohibit above ground parking? It it, it certainly could. Um, you know, it, it has, like I said, it's behaved as a sort of disincentive because above ground parking is counted towards your floor area. But with state density bonus law, like I said, it's made it, um, you know, a possibility to do it above ground. Well, right. And I understand above ground parking is less expensive than below ground parking, but no parking is cheaper than all of them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah and, so, and, I mean, I, I'm, yeah. I'm just sort of curious because I'm, I'm just a little concerned that with having design standards, people are going to take that as sort of permission to build, but maybe there's nothing we can do about that. I and think, obviously tonight we can't do anything about it. But yeah, I, I mean, think I, I think it's something that we're seeing and we are responding to it. Um, you know, there, there are examples, good examples, I think, you know, around the country and in and, and, and the state of, you know, screened above ground parking. It can be made to integrate uh, with the design, if done well, but it's it's certainly something new that we're seeing and we're needing to respond to it. Okay, thank you. Council Member Zwick. Uh, thank you so much um, for developing these standards. They're very thoughtful. Um, I, I had one question, just um, there were a couple of um, categories you went through, um, I'll just cite the, I think there was one about communal space that uh, comes to mind. 
where I know we're trying to create general standards so that, you know, there's uniformity, but also a lot of leeway for, for people to propose different things. And I'm just wondering, by way of example, you know, that picture um, in the bottom right looks like a lovely communal space. I don't really see which one of those, you know, categories it falls into per se. And I'm, I'm just wondering, like, you know, as novel spaces or, you know, um, designs or other things are being invented if we're being overly prescriptive by not allowing some other category under these under these various, uh, some other item under these various categories that essentially says some other version of this that meets the, the spirit herein in, in some way, whether it's in this or the same. Similarly, when it comes to entryways or a number of the other categories that you enumerated. You know, that is really a great question. Um, we anticipate these standards uh, as uh, we've, as, as we mentioned, we've done a fair amount of outreach in a very short time. So we've talked to the Planning Commission, the Architectural Review, Review Board, and uh, housing developers, members of the public have all provided their input. Um, so we've taken our best shot. Um, we, uh, we think that these are the best that we can do now, but it's also a work in progress. So as we, as we see those other solutions, uh, we can add to them. Uh, what what you just identified is actually one of the biggest challenges that we've had as we've been developing the standards because uh, the the provision of them being objective design standards um, typically we would have a a phrase uh, in the code that would say uh, or equal right. Uh, because these are objective design standards, we're not able to include something that would have that sense of judgment. It really has to be a clear cut yes or no. So if there are other categories that need to be included, we'll come back and say, we need to adjust these. Council Member Tarosis. Oh. Oh, Jesse, were you not finished? Keep yeah, going. I, mean, I, oh, I, 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 I apologize. Could, I decided I could be, but um, my... You can always come back again. I apologize. Yeah, uh, my only uh, just response, and, and you know the, the law in, in this much better than I, is just uh, if theoretically there were a set of objective criteria but not a short list of examples, I assume one could still satisfy a set of objective criteria without enumerating each example that is allowed? Well... Um, unfortunately, that what you described is more of a guideline than a standard. Mm. Um, and so, you know, I've been writing guidelines, you know, kind of uh, for a long time in my adult uh, career. But this is diff this is categorically different. Got it. Okay. Well, I just as long as we kind of uh, commit to maintaining flexibility, that sounds great. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Tarosis. Great. Sorry, Council Member. Yeah, no, no. Really appreciate the, the presentation. I would just say, um, and I'm getting to my question, but I'm concerned that we're behind on affordable, uh, yet far ahead on market rate. That's always been a concern of mine before I came to the Council. So with that in mind, um, have there been any kind of discussions or considerations of the unintended burdens that these design standards might place on affordable housing development, which could deter the construction of that really needed affordable housing? Absolutely. I mean, that was a concern as we were developing the standards. Uh, one of the primary intents is to not add, uh, not make an undue burden on our affordable housing developers. What we've found in Santa Monica and can continue to find is that the affordable housing that we see developed here is actually uh, often the best designed housing that we see in the city. Um, so uh, these standards are a minimum. We typically see in our affordable housing, we typically see a lot more than we're requiring. Um, so we don't believe that this will be any added burden. Got it. And I think when I, when I consider burden, I also consider timeline, right? Because these projects operate on very thin margins. Right. Um, and I think the faster you can expedite the affordable projects. I mean, any project really, but the better. So have we taken steps to minimize any of the unnecessary bureaucratic obstacles um, 
That's, to, to these that is the purpose of the objective design standards. So once we put these out to the public, to the, to the affordable housing community, they know exactly what's expected of them. And are we planning on then um, kind of keeping stock of the timeline, you know, pre-design standards, post-design standards that it takes to approve these projects just so that we can actually measure what success looks like here? Yeah, so I, I think to clarify, um, again, if you're an affordable housing provider, you would need to opt in to this Correct. process. So, yeah. you know, so certainly if they went down this road, like we could track that, right? Um, what the feedback that we've received from our affordable housing providers is they are very happy with Santa Monica's process. We, we have processed affordable housing projects in as quick as six weeks. Um, that's not the norm. It was like kind of an emergency and, you know, they, we were like doing he heaven and earth to kind of catch up on funding deadlines and what have you that were not communicated to us in time. But, you know, if we know there's timelines, um, we absolutely prioritize affordable housing. And we can get it through a process very, very quickly, um, you know, in terms of the entitlement process and ensuring across the board that all reviewing departments are on the same page. Yeah, I would just um, state that, appreciate that. I think it should, that should be the norm, not the exception to expedite. I, I, I think it is. Um, and it, I would love to see in the future if we could actually keep track of the timelines uh, across the board. And I think that um, Mr. Martin had told us that that was being worked on just for all the different types of permits, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. um, particularly imp important as we implement new interventions, like are they having any impact? Yeah, certainly. And I understand what you said at the beginning that you think that there are too many state imposed requirements. So you don't think that affordable housing developers are going to avail themselves of SB 35 streamlining, but in any event, still would like to see what comes of this. Sure. Thanks. Council Member Parra. Oh, thank you. I just had a comment. I wanted to um, first thank you for all the work on this. I really appreciate the detailed um, report, staff report and the presentation. I even understood it, so that was really great. Um, and I also wanted to, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, parking just because it, it was brought up. But I wanted to talk about it. I wanted to say something, too, because I know there's a lot of bikers in the room and, and up here. And I wanted to say that I have children, and I have children that are on biking teams for their school. So I'm 110% in support of it. But one of the things that I, I, I wanted to bring up, especially around like being inclusive and equitable, and I've brought this up many times around like affordability, um, especially as we're dealing, and we've been on and I've been dealing with aging parents, you know, um, the last thing that they want to do is give up their cars, <laughs> you know, number one. Number two, the other thing that they, that they are terrified of doing is jumping on public transportation because they're scared and they don't want to wait at a bus stop and even to even walk to a bus stop is difficult for, for them. And so when they are in and when our seniors or are infirmed, um, are in affordable housing, um, they need those parking spots. And so when we're talking about affordable housing for those in need that need it, um, they need those parking spots. And so please, when we're talking about um, affordable housing, we have to look at it from a lens for our entire community because it could be that college student, it could be that mother with those three kids, it could be that grandmother, it could be a variety of people. They could be able-bodied people, it could be people that are not able-bodied. And so I really need us to really think about who is going to be living in those units. It could be somebody that can ride a bike, it could be somebody that needs to live on the first floor, it could be somebody that can live on the, on the top floor. And we really have to remember that when we have these conversations up here and, you know, start talking about, let's get rid of all the parking. We don't need parking. We just need affordable units. That's not true. We need parking. There's people that need parking. There's people like that, if they can still drive, but they not, may not be able to walk to the corner, they may not be able to walk to the corner, but they may still be able to drive. And we need to think about that. I know you know that, we, but I think agree? we need to make this comment yeah. because this happens all the time. Oh, we don't need parking. Let's get rid of it. We, we agree. I mean, um, my 95-year-old mother uh, is still driving 
Yeah, I mean, and we so. just passed, and there was legislation, I mean, there was, you know, there so was legislation. We, you know, we that totally, was, totally get that. I mean, I mean um, I, and what we found is that the, uh, the state, uh, does not allow us to, in, in certain areas of the city, does not allow us to have minimum parking requirements. What we see is our affordable, uh, housing developers and our market rate developers understanding what the populations in their buildings need and providing parking that's that is will be there for their residents whether or not it's required by the city no and i recognize that there's you know they'll do like half of the parking you know but i, I think it's a really important conversation because people come for us all the time when i start talking about cars oh everybody ride a bike uh you know some people can't ride a bike you know and and that's that it is what it is you know again i have a household of bike riders in my house i've got 10 bikes in my house i get it but what, but what I'm trying to say is, like, I want to be inclusive and equitable and really speak and talk about everybody in our community. And that's that's what we need to do, you know. And so I just, I felt the need to say that. So thank you. Thank you. Council Member Terosis and Park, can you remove yourselves from the queue? Yes. Are you back in the queue? No, but I have That's okay. You can clear it. I just cleared it. I just learned that. My education goes on. I have a couple of questions, Stephanie, and, and let's stay with that slide for a minute. So you're saying that if you have 100 units, you have to have 400 square feet of open space for 100 units? Um, Is that, there, I'm looking at 10 by 10. Okay, so this. I'm, I'm confused because. Yeah, that's this not is very not, much. This is not the standard for the amount of space required. This is a standard that identifies the type of space for each 25 units. That there is a different requirement that is already embedded in the zoning code that requires uh, 60 square feet of common open space, uh, sorry, 60 square feet of private open space per unit, 40 square feet per unit of common open space. So um, so this is a different standard that helps shape the open space that is otherwise required. So in this particular building, you're and let me, I, I'm sure I'm wrong on this. You're saying every unit has 60 feet of open space plus there is 100 square feet per 25 units. Um, or is that an so, either or? Okay, so there is in the zoning code already that was uh, with the first cycle of implementation are standards for open space, standard requirements for open space. And I'm not looking at the zoning code right now, but as I recall, it's 100 square feet per, per unit divided into 60 feet of private open space, 40 feet of common open space. That can be combined, if you're an affordable housing developer, all of that can be common open space. So that would be 100 square feet per unit. And for 25 units, that means 2,500 square feet of open space. This simply shapes. So this is an additional. It's not an additional square footage. It's part it's of it. It's how to distribute that required square footage. Is that a maximum through state law? This is a minimum that we are creating that is not required by state law. And you're, you already know my next question. Can we go larger? Because for many people in various neighborhoods, we don't have a park within a quarter mile of them. So you mentioned the historic standards on San Vicente, for instance, courtyard and garden apartments, where many of those apartment houses had somewhat of their own park outside their front door. Right. So my question is, I think and it's the same question, is are we, is a developer going to look at that and say, well, that's the maximum because I can keep building more units? Um, with that standard, or is that a minimum, and can we increase that standard? Could okay. we go to uh, 10 by 15, oh, for well, instance, sure. every 25 units? Sure, we can. Again, this, 
This standard that you're seeing it is an attempt to shape the open space that is already required in the zoning code. That's a zoning code requirement that we are not changing with these uh, design requirements. So you're trying to create a, uh, those specific uh, barbecue outdoors, a uh, garden. We're, we're, wa a wanting to, uh, we're wanting to make sure that the space, that the common open space that's required, already required in the zoning code is shaped in order to be social space. It has a minimum size, it has some amenities, a minimum amount of landscaping. And I, and so the zoning code only requires the 10 by 10. The zoning code requires more than the 10 by 10. So it's the 10 by 10 plus the 60 per unit. It's a way to distribute it throughout. They're, they are not additive, they're, co they're separate standards that uh, are taught, speaking to different things. give people a chance to be outside. That's, that's the goal. And the tree code was one every 500 feet? Uh, that's on that a different is. page. I, uh, one tree per 500 square feet of common outdoor area. <laughs> and, and if you were doing 25 units, how many approximate square feet would you have? Would you have enough room to have a tree outside? Uh, if you have 25 units, there's 2,500 square feet of open space that's distributed around the building. Uh, and that's one of the things that we wanted to provide. If the open space is distributed around the building, then more people will naturally access it because it's nearer to their unit. And provide more social contact as well among neighbors. That's right. Okay, that's fine. Uh, I wanted to, parking. Um, I agree with Gleam. I don't think I've ever seen an above ground space I like. However, at the same time, the cost of underground parking has always been so incredible. And so while we can, we have managed to reduce the necessary amount of parking, um, I agree with Council Member Para. People are gonna park. And someone can rent your unit and work down the street and three months later, they suddenly are working six miles away with no light rail and no bus service uh, contiguous to where they're going. So they may have to have a car, as well as, yes, families with children and seniors. And yes, your mother is 95? She is. So if your mother and my mother hit each other with, and have an accident, we have a problem. Although but maybe, my mother maybe is, if they lived in the same place, they could carpool. There you go. My mother is fine, so she's still driving as well. Uh, only daytimes, I think, and in Santa Monica. But um, my, my question or my comment and question there is you're saying there are ways to build better above ground parking that isn't visible to the public as, oh my God, there's a parking lot there. Yes, I have seen it. Okay, and you said there's one in Culver City. Uh, this one in Culver City uh, it, on that slide. It's on Washington uh, Boulevard? Yes. Okay. It's called the plat it's part of the platform. Oh, yeah, I know the platform. Yeah. So how much does that reduce the cost? The cost of parking per underground space in Santa Monica is approximately? Don't have the numbers. I don't have the, I bet the you numbers. Do. Jing? Uh, Jing doesn't have the numbers. Oh. I mean, I thought uh, several, it was like 50 to 75 Several years ago, it was space. about $57,000 so a space. So it's space probably now. a lot more now. Uh, that's for subterranean parking. What's the cost? Uh, effectiveness versus the above ground parking? Uh, the, the above ground parking is just much less because of the, the, the above ground parking doesn't require uh, mechanical ventilation like below ground parking does. Then of course there's the, you know, there's the excavation, there's the waterproofing, you know, below grade is always more expensive. I don't have the numbers in my head. I'm sorry, I can't keep all that information okay. in there. Um, and, and while I support alternative transportation, 
I don't have 10 bikes in my house. But um, I, I will say that as much as we want to decrease the amount of unnecessary parking in our city and provide unbundled parking wherever possible, uh, I support that. But I also know there is a necessity for families and other people to have cars. And considering we've closed one grocery store, we're about to close the second major grocery store in the city, it'll become even more incumbent for the next two or three years for a lot of people with families or seniors to have a car in the city. So um, what else in this, pro in this whole SB 35, is there anything else that you would pick out as um, a great part of it or a really poor part of it that you wish we didn't have to do? You mean the, of the standards? Yeah. Um, these are all standards that um, we stand behind, that we will ask. You know, I, I sit with all of our developers um, at, before they go through the entitlement process usually, certainly be, before they go through the architectural review board process. And these are principles that we talk about uh, for our above, above market rate or market rate housing as well as affordable housing. So these are pretty sound fundamental principles that I think we would be proud to have them as part of the code. And they will make living in Santa Monica better. Uh, living in Santa Monica is fantastic. It will be fantastic. <laughs> That's a and good PR move. This, this will make it, this will make, make sure that we maintain that level of quality. My, my last question was, you made an earlier statement that on the surface of it lately, I disagree with, and it may be relevant, but you said Santa Monica had better design standards than LA. And honestly, with the new buildings going up, we seem to be sort of a cookie cutter, cracker jack developments. What, how are our standards better than Los Angeles? Because I seem to see the same things in Hollywood that I see on Lincoln Boulevard in Santa Monica. Well, I'm, I'm a little disappointed you feel that way because um, that's not my experience. Um, it's possible that you're talking about West Hollywood. I was the urban designer there for the city no, for, I know you for were. five years. So that city looks great. Um, <laughs> um, that may be a little subjective. <laughs> um, uh, you know, I, I see development across the border in, uh, in Los Angeles that um, I think is not up to the standard in Santa Monica. That's, that's my own unbiased personal view. How, how do we, the last question for me is, is I've been talking about the spirit of Santa Monica a little bit and making sure we stay distinct and unique from our behemoth across the border. Are these standards going to help us be distinct and unique from LA, or do we absolutely. continue to blend in? Uh, absolutely. Um, the, these standards don't exist in the city of Los Angeles, so um, so I think that these will these will certainly help ensure that we continue to maintain the quality that we have here. Is well, there's one more question. Is there anything else we can do as a city to make the standards more unique or distinct from LA uh, as, a, as an architectural basis rather than just the same looking slab buildings? Um, I really think this is a great set of standards. And as we, you know, as, as Jing mentioned, we're, we're not sure we're going to see a lot of people rushing in to use these standards. Um, but as we do use them, as we consider them, as we continue to develop the standards for the Bergamot area plan, we'll continue to learn and develop and we'll always get better. We always do. Thank you very much. I, I love the boosterism for Santa Monica. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Zwick. I uh, make a motion to move the item. Second. We have we have we have three items, so 
I think, no, I think we have to be specific right. to each of the three items. We have the first one, I believe, is CEQA, and it's calling for a motion to adopt a fine of no possibility. No, I'm not. We can do all three, can all three together. We can do all three together? Yes. Okay. Council Member Zwick, would you like to make that motion? I would move that we adopt all three, the CEQA exemption, the ordinance, uh, and the resolution. Thank you. We have a second by by Mayor Pro Tem Negretti. Is there any other discussion? Seeing none, can we have a roll call vote? Councilmember Zwick? Yes. Councilmember Parr? Yes. Councilmember Davis? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Negretti? Yes. Councilmember Tarosis? Yes. And Mayor Brock? Yes. And that item passes 6 0. Item 10B, introduction and first reading of an ordinance to amend municipal court, I'm sorry, municipal code 4.68.160 athletic events. What was that yours? I was wondering why I had two. Hi, good evening. Good evening. Sorry, I was waiting for the um, to give Nikki just one minute ah. to pull up the PowerPoint. <laughs> Working fast. Very having mouse issues. No worries. Hi, good evening, Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem Council, Jeanette Gant, Community Recreation Manager. Uh, tonight I'm presenting to you the first reading of the ordinance to amend Chapter 4.68 of the Municipal Code to allow for one additional 5K and one additional 10K race route and to move the earliest possible start time of a race from 7.30 a.m. to 7 a.m. The Community Event Policy and Municipal Code Chapter 4.68 provide a coordinated process for managing community events to ensure the health and safety of event patrons, residents, workers, and other visitors, to prohibit illegal activities from occurring at community events, and to protect the rights of the community event permit holders. There are currently three race routes authorized per Section 4.68.160 of the Municipal Code. There has been a desire by local race organizers to increase opportunities for participation in terms of the number of runners allowed for each race, which can be achieved by the race taking place on larger streets. In addition to the proposed addition of two race routes, incorporating an earlier start time would also create greater opportunities for participation. Both proposed changes support local race events to be more lucrative and economically sustainable for race organizers. The two proposed additional routes are detailed in the staff report, and here is a map of the proposed additional 10K route, which would be called the 10K Ocean City route. The race would begin and end at the 1400 block of Ocean Avenue. The proposed additional 5K route is shown here and would be called the 5K Ocean City route, also beginning and ending at the 1400 block of Ocean Avenue. With these two new routes, race organizers could host pre- and post-race events in nearby Tongva Park on 3rd Street Promenade or in the surrounding downtown area. These new routes also allow for participants to park in downtown parking lots, uh, or parking structures, excuse me, and, take, and or take the metro and walk to the start of the race. To minimize impacts on residents and businesses along the route, and is, as is already the case with other approved routes, staff proposes to restrict the day and time of the week that the new routes could be used. Races may only occur on Saturday and Sunday mornings from 7 a.m. until 11 a.m., and there shall be no more than a total of three 5K or, and or 10K races per year in the city regardless of route, with one of those races occurring in May, two in September, October, or November, separated by at least seven weeks. Thank you. That is my brief presentation for you all. I'm happy to answer any questions. Hi. Are there any questions? I'll move the item. 
If there aren't, Council Member Parra moves the item. Second. We have a second from Council Member Tarosis. No? No, Doesn't matter. Okay. Uh, can we have a roll call vote? I'm sorry, just to confirm that was Parra and Tarosis? Parra moved. Tarosis Second. seconded. The Gretty thirds. <laughs> Councilmember Tarosis? Yes. Council, um, I'm sorry, Mayor Pro Tem Negrete? Yes. Councilmember Davis? Yes. Councilmember Parra? Yes. Councilmember Zwick? Yes. Mayor Brock? Yes. And that, that item passes 6 0. Item 11A, award request for proposal and enter into agreement with Sasaki Associates Incorporated for a community outreach process, visioning services, and concept design for the airport conversion project. Good evening. Good evening. It is nice to be with you again. So thank you for having us, Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem, Council members. Uh, city staff and community members that are here. I'm Amber Rashane with Public Works, the Acting Chief Operating Officer, and we're here to present the uh, Santa Monica Airport process, uh, and hopefully we'll have a good conversation about this. Uh, so tonight, just a quick overview. Uh, we'll be going through a little bit of the recommended uh, actions from the staff, because there are a number of them in the staff report. Uh, the RFQ and RFP process. The recommended consultant team, who we also have a representative here from, so you'll get to meet uh, Sasaki and ask questions. Um, talk about the proposed process and timeline, and then staffing and funding. So there are seven, six recommended actions. Uh, the first one is about CEQA. The next three, so number two, three, and four, are about Sasaki, awarding the RFP, providing direction on the process, authorizing the contract negotiation, Number five is about the staffing uh, position. And then number six is to enact the financial budget impact. So there are a lot of them, but they kind of break down into some categories. So hopefully that helps keep them straight. So we wanted to go and just remind everyone, right, that in January we came before you, so almost a year ago, and we were excited to start. These were the goals that we um, said we wanted to use and that you guys approved for us to move forward with. These are the frame that we used for the RFQ and the RFP. Uh, the first one is the council priorities for 2325 uh, up there. So those are our overarching goals for the whole community. So uh, making sure that we're accountable. Then going into the great park goals that came out of the um, uh, airport conversion report, um, remembering to use those as well as a, a frame for this uh, project. And then the Living Community Challenge, uh, using sustainability and regener regeneration, resiliency, and using <clears throat> the idea that this park should go on for many, many generations. We heard a lot of people talk about that tonight. So it's really exciting to, 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 to hear that and to um, continue to use these as a frame. Uh, we also heard a lot tonight about Measure LC. Absolutely. Uh, this was one that maybe we didn't uh, stress enough in the 1010 meeting, so we heard again that we want to make sure that Mother LC is always at the forefront. Um, and hopefully you noticed in the staff report that we said Great Park many, many times. We said consistent with Measure LC many, many times. Um, and a lot of the recommendations that staff is making focuses us on a great park. So that is one thing that we wanted to make abundantly clear tonight is that the project is focused on one, closing the airport, and two, around a great park. So I've heard a lot of consensus around that tonight, and that's very exciting. <clears throat> so just quickly, uh, we, as I mentioned, we're here in January. We did an RFQ process, request for qualifications. That was released in early spring. It closed with 27 teams. Uh, we shortlisted eight of those. Um, then the RFP, or request for proposal, went out to those eight shortlisted uh, teams. They all responded, which was great. Uh, we shortlisted five teams and had them interview in July. And then the evaluation committee made their notice of recommendation in August. And so we're here before you tonight with staff's recommendation of Sasaki. And who better to tell you about themselves then uh, I'd like to introduce Anna uh, Kors from Sasaki. Here's Anna. Thank you. 
Thank you. Um, thank you all for the opportunity to present tonight. I'm Anna Kors. I'm a landscape architect principal at Sasaki, and I'm the principal in charge for this project. <laughs> As Amber mentioned, we have started this process back in February, so I also wanted to pause before I dove in tonight to talk about the long history and the many conversations that have led us to where we are today and how we can talk about now the future of the airport. When Sasaki first saw this RFQ back in February, we were really blown away by the opportunity. It's, it's amazing. It's immense. It's really a once-in-a-generation opportunity. When we saw the RFP, we really started to get excited around these ideas of what the future of the airport could be. Could it be an ecosystem restoration on a mega scale? Could it be a beacon of sustainability that was around reusing and repurposing materials? Could it balance community needs while constantly thinking about implementation? And how can we have quick wins that help us move this project forward? This is a legacy project, and I come from a legacy firm. Hideo Sasaki founded this firm over 70 years ago. He was actually born in California. He was a landscape architect, and he was a pioneer in thinking about an integrated practice. He believed we needed to come together to really tackle some of the biggest challenges we are facing in our world. Contribution is the only value. That was the ethos of our firm, and that is the DNA that we have in our firm today. We are now over 350 professionals in this integrated practice of landscape architects, ecologists, civil engineers, planners, urban designers, architects, interior designers. And we work together across the globe with five offices, four in the United States. And our employees come from over 30 countries and speak over 45 languages. We ask people to come to these projects, bring their full authentic selves so that we can work on, plan, and create some of the most iconic spaces in this country. We do this by thinking about implementation. So when we start planning, we're constantly thinking about the end. How do we move this forward? How do we think beyond just this planning document? For us, it's about creating partnerships, being partners with you all, the city, being partners with the community. This is an example of four projects over the past year where we've partnered with our cities to help think about dollars from state, federal, and philanthropic dollars to really help us move into a first phase. And we don't want to start and stop at a first phase. We want to think about the holistic entirety of a project. So we'll think about governance structures and how can we look at both the operations and costs of a park and how can we offset that with revenue. And this is something we do across the country in thinking about these great parks. For every project, we craft every team. I think you know, uh, Sasaki is quite unique in the fact that we have a lot of airport conversion projects. In fact, my grad school project was on converting an airport. Ironically, didn't realize I'd be here doing this again. Um, we have a team that has experience on four of these airport conversion projects, and I have been the design principal for the past three years on Alinicon Metropolitan Park, which is converting Athens International Airport <laughs> into Europe's largest urban park. My practice is around creating great parks, amazing civic spaces, people that come to these places and creating memories for them. I love talking to community members. I want to understand where the passion, where the challenges, where the pain points are, and converting those ideas into a concept, into a vision that can tackle some of the biggest challenges, like this site that was once an old brownfield, a rail yard, where we took 300,000 cubic yards of arsenic and created landform that became an iconic part of the project. But it's all about those connections and making connections for the community members, making connections to those spaces that keep them coming back for generation after generation. My team is a fully interdisciplinary team. As I said, I'm a landscape architect. I'll be the principal in charge. But we have experts in sustainability, planning, ecology, um, and other landscape architects with this specific experience on converting airports. Our team is supported by national and local consultants. We have the Robert Group to help us with community engagement. They were on our team from the RFQ, also in the RFP, and will be on our team now. We're very excited to be working with them. We'll also be doing market and economic analysis. We'll be doing um, soil remediation and really getting into the details of sustainability early on, especially when we start doing our due diligence phase. So engagement. For us, it's not a phase. This is a holistic conversation that needs to be woven into the entire process. We do this by believing that there is no best practice. Every community is different. So what we did in Baton Rouge might not work here. So we want to understand engagement through the foundations. So we believe in building community ownership. We want to connect people to grow empathy between neighbors. We want to honor the lived experience. While we have experience in creating great parks, 
You all live and breathe Santa Monica, and I've heard a lot from amazing, passionate community members tonight. We want to listen first, and then we want to understand who did we miss, and we want to adapt our engagement approach to go out and reach those people to make sure their voices are heard. We want to use um, a variety of tools, whether it's high-tech surveys online or whether it's low-tech walk and talks. We want to ensure that engagement is approachable and reachable for all community members. And we want to go beyond the non-traditional, we want to go beyond the traditional outreach and think about pop-ups and opportunities to go to the community to get that feedback, to talk to kids, because kids have the best ideas about parks, I have to say. And then finally, engagement is tied to the design. No matter where you direct us to go tonight, we know that engagement will help inform our design. So one thing we'll start with is having a website, both in English and Spanish, that becomes a place where everyone knows the information is. Any updates, if they want to give us feedback, they can always come to this website. We'll also do a deep dive into the analysis of the site, due diligence, understand what's there, how things are working. These are examples from other projects and how we started to tease out some of those ideas. And then ultimately going out to the community and understanding what they want, what are their desires, and start looking at that and how that ranks as we move forward. We have a, a lot of work to do in our due diligence phase, which is understanding the site, the environmental conditions, the larger systems at play. And we're going to get pretty technical, but it's important that we take that technical information and come back out. It needs to be transparent, and we need to demystify information. We all need to come from the same point, a foundation of understanding what's there to move forward. And then we embed the feedback into decision making. So one of the first things we'll do is have guiding principles that are taking the feedback from the community. And those guiding principles will serve as a foundation for our designs, for our scenarios as we move forward. When we come with scenarios, we want them to be very different. We want to think about the programming, the water, the ecology, how those systems fit on site. And we want people to not choose a scenario. We want them to tell us what was it about that programming element, that connectivity that worked. That way we can tease out the best ideas and come together with one scenario that is really reflective of the community and helps us move forward. And for us, this isn't just about getting to a plan. This is about the excitement we want to generate with the community. What happens on day one when the airport closes? Maybe we plant a million sunflowers like we did in Lakeview um, outside of Toronto. It became a place where the community came, got excited, and knew something amazing was coming. We know this is an incredible opportunity. This is a legacy for Santa Monica. And we are so excited to be here at this point, finally, <laughs> to talk to you and to hopefully move forward. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. So hopefully that gave you a pretty good flavor for Sasaki. It seems like there has been a lot of support tonight for them. So we hope that we you know, are, are finding agreement. Uh, I'm going to talk through a little bit about the process that was outlined in the staff report. Uh, it is based around five phases. Um, many of those you will have heard Anna touch on, the, uh, on how to bring projects from sort of that concept through implementation. Um, and we'll go through each one of these. <clears throat> so uh, one thing to note, it's five phases. The community outreach is throughout the process. And so I'm going to dig in a little bit to the community outreach, because at the bottom there, you'll see the outreach milestones. And so leading up to each one of those milestones, there are a series of community outreach activities <clears throat> that are proposed and are meant to get to the community. And as Anna talked about, reaching out to folks who are not have not participated typically, or that we're noticing that voices aren't there, um, and, and those sorts of things, that we're really trying to be inclusive of all Santa Monicans, um, and doing that in a variety of ways. So first and foremost, uh, one large community event in person, um, another large community event virtually. This lets us get to folks who maybe can't come for life circumstances or, or whatever it is. Um, that they're not able to join the in-person meetings. Maybe they're out of town, or maybe they have folks at home that they're taking care of um, and are not able to make it to the meeting. It also uh, allows people with different personality types. Right? Some folks do really well in big groups. Some people don't. They do much better in a, a smaller group where they can, where they can, uh, or a, a more anonymous group. Um, and so those virtual events um, paired with the in-person kind of help us reach uh, a wide variety of folks. Again, at all of these uh, 
events, we would have um, translation and interpretation into Spanish so that we're, we're getting the message out widely. Um, a digital survey, as Anna mentioned, um, on the website um, around the topic that we're studying in each of the phases. Um, this lets folks provide commentary at whatever time of day or night that they have the ability to, right, um, and having QR codes around the city so that we can um, garner feedback where people are. Um, to further that, having uh, pop-up events, um, as Anna talked about, right, going to PTA meetings, going to farmers markets, going to other community events, and maybe some of the races that Jeanette was talking about, right, to actually meet our, our community members where they are and engage them in conversation around the, the, the goals of each of the phases. Um, then four focus group meetings. Um, those will kind of change and, and shift over the time as, uh, as, as the phases change, but they're meant in those small group discussion areas. So we've got the opportunities for large group, we've got the opportunities for medium groups, virtual and in person, and in small group discussions. Um, you heard from a number of our council, uh, boards and commission members, um, this evening that they want to be included. And the way that we've, uh, laid out the process, um, is to go to the community first, come back to those boards and commissions, hear what their input is on what we've learned so far, and then come to council. So at each of those outreach milestones, we are coming back to you and saying, here's what we've heard, here's what we've heard from boards and commissions, and now council, here's the information so that you can give us feedback throughout the process. So it's not just kind of a, hey, here's the plan at the end. Right? There's, there's multiple opportunities to provide input. So phase one is really dealing with what's missing today, as Anna talked about, right, um, doing a gaps analysis, understanding what we have, right, the uh, document review, we do have some information already. We want to make sure that Sasaki gets up to speed on what we know about the airport so far. But there's a lot of things that we don't know. There's a lot of things that we think we know and we need more information about. And so phase one is really about figuring out um, those technical studies because we're going to need to do a lot of um, sort of that, um, the technical analysis about what's on the land, what's under the land, and what is the ecology in and around the land, right? What should we be doing with this? Phase two uh, will be focused on, uh, we call it discovering the place or setting the stage. That's that deep dive into those existing conditions. So once we know what's not there uh, or what, what information we don't have yet, um, we assume that there is reme remediation work that needs to be done. We need to dig into where that is. We know that there's connectivity issues to this site on bicycle, ped, auto, uh, transit, all of it. Um, you, it's not really easy to get to right now. So what are those networks that are um, present that we should increase or enhance? Um, and, and understanding that. The ecology of the place. Uh, Anna talked a little bit about that as well. In what is currently there, right? It's been an airport for a long time, and they don't, you know, it, the flora and fauna has totally changed from what it was. Um, so, what is in our what, it, what is in our area and our region, and what is important for Santa Monica to understand um, about the land? Um, this is paired with all of the community outreach activities that we spoke about. So, in front of each of these milestones, we have a series of outreach events on these topics. Um, that gets us to guiding principles. And so if you look at the timeline at the top <clears throat> as a suggestion, we're talking about starting in early spring um, and that we'd get to those guiding principles in early 2025. Um, that's where we're actually saying, what do we want to study? This happens before pen is ever put to paper, right? The first two phases are really about listening and learning and analyzing what do we have what do we need? What do we want? And what does council tell us to focus on? Right? After listening to the community, after listening to boards and commissions, there are two points for council to weigh in before Sasaki has ever drawn anything. So the first eight months of this project really are about deeply understanding what do we have before we move forward. Um, and we think that that makes it so that we have a well-informed decision on how to go forward. Uh, phase three is where we start to look at scenarios. So some of those drawings that um, Anna uh, showed you um, are focused around whatever those guiding principles are. So once the guiding principles are set, then the three scenarios would be created. And as she mentioned, they would be very different. While all centered around the, the, the guiding principles, um, it is 
uh, on purpose to generate ideas and conversation. And I like the parts and pieces of this one. I like more of the ones over here. I don't like this one so much. This thing is too close to this other thing. Those types of things. And I want to be very clear. All three options are focused on a great park. If that did not come through in the staff report, <laughs> I, I, we are remiss, but we tried very uh, hard to make sure that it was very clear that all three options will be focused on a great park. It is what balance of um, activities, passive recreation, um, active recreation, are they sports fields, are they pickleball courts, are they, right, what, what, what do we want, what do we need? Looking around in the read, in, in, within Santa Monica, what do our parks have and what do we need to augment with this one? Uh, from those three um, scenarios, again, a series of outreach meetings, going to boards and commissions and coming to council, right? And again, you get to weigh in and say, we like this one or that one, I like the parts of this one and that one, I agree with the community on what they said here, but we really think we want to focus over there. And then that gets us to that preferred scenario. And so the preferred scenario is where uh, Sasaki has taken that information from the three scenarios, come up with a preferred scenario, and again, we go back to the community. We go back to the boards and commissions, and we go back to council, where you get to say um, sort of the, the, the final commentary on what is that preferred plan, and is that what we're, we as a community are excited about. Then the phase four is where we have that final plan. So Sasaki will take um, the comments from boards and commissions, community, and council, and come up with that final plan. And that would be presented at the end of phase four. What that gets us for that preferred plan um, is what we will be moving forward with with those regulatory frameworks that really codify that and make it a realistic plan that we can enact. So we've gone from inception through design and to that implementation. This is where we would be studying um, the phasing plan, um, a deep dive into funding. Um, I, I forgot to mention in phase one and two, we are also, HRNA is on board, um, and they have a group that specializes in parks and how to fund parks and how to do parks at state, federal, and um, uh, regional levels of funding sources. And so HRNA is all the way through, but in this phase four is where we're really coming in with how do we fund what we've, what we've, what we've drawn and said is our preferred option. Uh, phase five is really about the book that says, here's all the work that we've done. Here's all the studies, all the reports, all of the feedback from the community. Here's the three options and what we heard and the final preferred scenario. And that's sort of our vision book for going forward. So where we are is right here. <clears throat> We're at the beginning. We are really excited to start. Um, and there were some early visioning things that occurred right about a decade ago. Um, and we are excited to envision what can be done with 227 acres. The early visioning studies were really just about the non-airport lands. Um, at the end of the process that what we've just described will be here. And that's when that preferred plan sets us up for doing the environmental review that we'll need to do, the specific plan zoning and ordinance uh, updates, uh, or uh, uh, general plan updates that we'll need to do, so that it's all in that regulatory framework. <clears throat> Staff is also recommending um, the addition of one position as a limited term. Uh, this is a principal level position within architecture services of uh, public works. Um, this is, and we're recommending to use park and recreation development impact funds to fund the Sasaki work as well as the staffing position. This further um, illustrates our intent on this being a park, right? We are not allowed to use park and recreation impact funds if we are not focused on a park. So we're hoping that this further solidifies that goal and intent so that we're all on the same page. <clears throat> um, okay, and then, all right, back to recommended actions. So. This is what we're asking tonight. Um, we do recognize that one council member is not here. Uh, so while we're, we're looking at CEQA, and it seems like there are a lot of things that we actually agree on. It seems like awarding the RFP to Sasaki, there's consensus around that. It seems like uh, the authorization of the contract, there's consensus around that. It, from what I've heard from public comment and from what our boards and commissions um, have shared, there's consensus around funding for the staffing position. Um, number three 
is where maybe there's some questions, right? And that's the process and approval. And maybe I've clarified everything and we're all in agreement and that would be amazing. Um, but one thing that we could do is uh, have a motion around one, two, four, five, and six. And we could say that number three is something that we come back for when um, we have a full council as an option. We can also vote on all six. It's up to you all. But we look forward to your questions. Um, hopefully we've answered a lot of them already. Um, but thank you for your time. And um, back to you. And I see that Council Member Davis is right on the draw. Go ahead. So could you put up the slide um, that had to do with, uh, oh, God, now I'm trying to figure out the best way to describe it. I guess the go back, back, process, back, 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 back. Uh, in Sasaki's or ours? No, it was, it was in Sasaki's, actually, okay. I'm pretty sure. Just tell me when. Yeah, I'll tell you when. Well, you know what? Um, let, let, let me start out with some okay. questions, and then maybe we'll figure this. I mean, I'll figure it out. I apologize okay. for that. No problem. So, so first of all, you said we're starting out with the idea of a great park. But I, I, I'll be honest with you. I think if you were to go around and ask a bunch of people in Santa Monica, what does that mean? Mm -hmm. You'd get a lot of different answers. And, and for some people say, yeah, Great Park should be the centerpiece, but there should be other stuff. And other people think Great Park is park, nothing but park, nothing but park. So when you say we're going to start with the definition of it or start the process with the understanding it's going to be a Great Park, what are you talking about since you're going to be the ones guiding the process? So the intent was, right, that it is consistent with Measure LC. And there are a lot of questions um, or dif different opinions. I've seen people say it's the 187 acres, the whole 227. Right? There's a lot of things out there. And so the way the process is designed is to listen to the community, right? give people space to, to talk um, after we've done some very deep dive on the technical and help and then come to agreement or conclusion on what should be in or out, what's included or not. It gives council the ability to, at two different points before we have ever put pen to paper to say, we want more of this or less of that. Uh, you know, if someone says we want to keep the airport open forever, we can say thank you for that opinion, but that is not what the goals of this project have been. The, the community has been resolute in wanting to close it um, with that intention. Um, and so the way the process is designed right now is to allow um, discussion and community input, but there's always sort of the, the guardrails of the guidelines that we talked about at the very beginning, and that there are two points for council to weigh in before um, any options are put forward. Does that answer it? No. It oh, okay. Actually. <laughs> um, so, so let me, maybe I need to be more specific. I, I, I'm thinking of two great urban parks in Paris, Luxembourg Gardens and Tuileries. Each of those is between 55 and 60 acres. Mm -hmm. So would a great park be something the size of the Luxembourg Gardens and the Tuileries combined, which would be roughly 110 acres, but obviously there's 200 acres out at the airport. I mean, that, that's what I'm trying to get at, is when you say we're starting with a great park, I, one of the things I don't want to do in this is create expectations, because we know there are people who say park, park, and nothing but park, and, and maybe that's where we end up going. But if that's not what you think, and you're going to entertain community input on things other than park uses, whether it's housing or uh, commercial uses or whatever, then we're going to be, we're going to have a real problem because people are going to say, yes, they're focused on a great park. And then you're going to go out into the community and say, well, do you want some housing there? And they're all going to go berserk going, why are you asking that? Because you're focused on a great park. So I ask again, uh -huh. when you say, to the public tonight, we are focused on a great park. What do you mean? Well, in reading LC, right, it is about all 227 acres. So that is the frame that we have been using. That um, where those existing uses, right, I've heard people talk about, well, the 40 acres where the existing buildings are, they can stay the way that they are, right? LC says that. So, okay, is that what we want? Do we want to have conversation around what happens in those buildings or not? Do we keep that? 
But the idea about the park is that it is a dominant, you know, inside the fence line at a minimum, right? I think when most people say we want the airport to be a park, it is that inside that fence line is what most people are talking about. It is maybe not exactly the way LC has been, um, is, is written, but at a minimum, that is kind of the frame of it. But we also, as we go and talk to the community, people are going to say all sorts of things, but that's where we get to come back and say, is that in alignment with what the goals of this project are? And so I, I don't, I don't have an opinion on that, right? I, we want to listen to the community and figure out where there's consensus. Okay, so, uh, and, and I appreciate that. I, I don't think tonight we should be prejudging what the outcome of this process will be. We're talking about the process, not the end result. But clearly, in all honesty, I'm not sure everyone agrees with that. You know, I mean, there's part of me that's going, why are we even going through this? If all we're going to do at the end is come up with 227 acres of park, why are we going to spend $2.7 million to go out in the community and ask them what they want? Why don't we just send Sasaki out to say design a 227-acre park and come back to us? I mean, that that to me is, you know, and they could still come up with three scenarios, one that has more recreational facilities, one that's entire passive park, one that's got, you know, I don't know, fa urban farmland or something. But, but when we have public process, there's an expectation that people will be listened to. So just hear me out here. If we had a process and a significant portion of the community said, yeah, we want, we want park. We want a hundred acres of park. We want the Tuileries and Luxembourg Gardens, but we also want some housing. Or we also want some, uh, community, uh, I don't know, uh, you know, am amenities, you know, whether it's a small grocery store or something. Are we going to tell them that's nice? Thank you for your input. We're ignoring it now because we're great park focused. Or are you going to come back and say, "Hey, we heard this, and and this has to be incorporated"? I'm just I'm just trying to get a sense because the one thing I don't want to do is create a situation where we go out and and that was the slide I was looking for was the one about the public process. So at some point when you can go back to that one, um, but create a situation where people are going out, they're giving their input. They sit around a room and they say, everyone in this room wants to put house, some housing at the park. Maybe they don't want to turn it all into housing, but they would like some housing. And then you come back and go, that's nice. A lot of people said they want housing, but we're focused on a great park. So that that's the sort of push-pull I'm trying to get here about not creating unfair expectations, because I don't want to go out in the community, find out what the community wants, and then tell them that's nice, but we're not doing that. But never mind. Yeah. Uh, that's fair. Um, from... All of the feedback that we've heard, I think what really is um, the tipping point or trigger point is that ballot measure, right? And the idea that we wouldn't close the airport. Um, and so during this process, right, we, we want to be mindful that we are intending to close the airport and turn it into a park. I think some of the... Um, hesitancy around listening to what the full community wants to say, potentially, whatever it is, is that, well, if we do something that is outside of Measure LC, then we have to go back to a ballot. Um, and that's a real fear and concern, and I, I, we get that. Um, the idea that um, with deep understanding of the technical aspects, that we know that and understand that, um, and when that gets triggered and what it means, um, what's included and what isn't, right? The idea of a park, there are supporting uses that are allowed. Um, we'd want to spend some time on that. And I think we'd like to come back with a, with an understanding of when does LC bend and when does it break? And then that can help us focus on what do we want to say? What do we want to hear? People can say, right? In a community meeting, people can say whatever they want. Um, and, but I appreciate your, your, your concern around saying you can say anything, but we're only going to do these things over here. I, I, I hear that and that's, 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 that's real. Um, but I think if it is, um, knowing that there is a big park and determining what size that park is, right? I, I don't know what size that is. That's why we want to go to the community in multiple iterations to say what, what does this actually mean? Right now, there's a lot of ideas out there, but we don't have all of that information. And so we want to 
start the project where we can start to talk about these things um, in realistic fashion around a park and then figure out what does that actually mean. Does that help? Uh, I guess a little. I, I, I still worry that we're creating false expectations out there that we're going to be listening to people and then at the end. But but maybe that's just our cross to bear here. So let me ask you about you. You focused on LC a lot. And LC says if we're going to do anything than recreational or park facilities, that we need to go to a vote of the people. But there's nothing in the Sasaki. Sasaki doesn't get to call the vote. That's a that's the council, correct? Absolutely. So we can go through this whole process, and maybe there is a Sasaki comes up with a proposal, and council works on it, and we go through the whole process. And uh, no, what do you want? Yeah, no, the one where you talked about the various meetings you were going to have and stuff. That one, yeah, that one. Stop there. There we go. Stop there. I have questions about that, but. Um, but, but I have a couple of questions about this. So we could go through this process. And we could say, okay, here's the Sasaki recommendation based on what they hear in the community. Let's say we get that recommendation, and I think this is optimistic, in 2026, right? You know, early 2026. I, I, I appreciate you trying to move this on a pretty fast timetable, but public outreach in Santa Monica takes a long time. So in 2026, we don't have to say, oh, okay, now we have that. Now we must go to the ballot. We, in fact, there's an argument that you're putting the cart before the horse, and I'm going to ask some questions of the city attorney in a minute, because putting something on the ballot unless and until there's been a final decision to close the airport might not be the right thing to do. So we can have the work of Sasaki, but could wait, for example, until 2029 after the airport was closed and say, okay, now the airport is officially closed. Now let's go to the ballot and see if this is what people want to do. Correct. Well, I mean, I will let that yeah, is that right. correct? Yes. So, so let me ask about closing the airport because I think there's, there is no doubt that this council on numerous opinion occasions has passed resolutions that it desires to close the airport. There's certainly no doubt that a lot of people out there want to close the airport. But in fact, is any of that sufficient to require the airport to close or does there have to be a vote of the council at some point in time to officially decide to close the airport? Yes, a further vote would be required of the council. Okay, and and do we have some idea about when that vote might be, or when it has to be? Well, if you want it to close as of January first, twenty nine, obviously before that. Uh, if you took that vote, say next year, then a later council could change that again before twenty nine. There's that possibility. So I guess what I'm hearing is. You know, the council always has it within their ability to decide whether or not to close the airport up until December 31st, 2028. But, for example, it, 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 it could be December 18th, 2028, that that's the final vote to close the airport. It's possible. Okay. Although so, a certain notice would be required of... Sure. You know, so. Yeah, I mean, it would have to be agendized and would have... I mean, I mean notice to the tenants out there and that kind right. of thing. Right, Okay. So, so I mean, that, that, that is, I mean, it seems to me that one of the things we want to be mindful of is putting the cart before the horse. It's sort of like, you know, I'm, I'm planning my retirement now. That doesn't mean I'm retiring tomorrow, right? Or some people who might want me to. But my point is, so we can go through this process, but the end of the process doesn't necessarily mandate or trigger that we have to have a vote specifically at the end of this process. Is that correct? The, the end of this planning process? Yeah, yeah, the planning process. It, it's not required, no. Okay, and it would be up to council when and if something were to be put on the ballot pursuant to Measure LC. Correct. So the council could say, thank you for the planning process. We now know what the community wants to do. But we have all these other things we need to do, as the city attorney pointed out, to close the airport. We probably have to change regulations. We have to give notice to the tenants out there. We probably have to pass enacting ordinances, all of that stuff. So we could say, now we know we have a great plan. Let's go forward and do all of that. And then, to the extent we want to enact that plan after the airport's closed, thereby not running the risk of what some people expressed, which was putting something on the ballot before the airport closed and therefore making that an electoral issue, we could do that afterwards. And in fact, it might be the way to do it because asking people to vote on a plan before there's been a final decision that the airport's going to be closed could lead to even greater disappointment if in fact, you know, the council decided, you know what, we're rethinking that, right? Okay. Um, so let's talk about the outreach before the milestones. 
So how are you going to notify people about all these great events? So that's one of the big ones, right, is getting the word out, letting people know. So certainly using the social media st strategies uh, or, or outlets that the city has, but that's where working with um, our community partners, right? So if we are trying to uh, reach out to different groups, right, do we post this in PTA uh, newsletters at blast? Are we putting this out? With our, our farmers market groups, when they are sending out a blast, our community gardeners, right? Who, what, whatever groups we are trying to elicit more information from, and that's a little bit where um, help from the Roberts group comes in as well, is that they've done work in, um, in and around our community. And so what groups are we reaching out to? How do we get the information about all of these things out to the widest maximum amount of folks in Santa Monica? I mean, for example, could we do a citywide mailing? Certainly could. I mean, I, mean, I, I, I mean, here's my concern. Posted around, is like we use QR all codes. these tools, yeah, and we still get the very same people coming out. Yeah. So how do we break through that? You know. So um, you know, one of the things we talked about, you know, in a previous iteration of what we might do is have we had discussions about providing childcare and/or food and doing some of these throughout various times. People who are working two jobs aren't going to come to a meeting on a Thursday night but they might come on a Saturday afternoon. Yes. You know, so, so when I hear one large community event, I ask, I'm asking myself, is that enough? Because whenever you schedule it, I guarantee there's going to be a lot of people who would like to come but can't. Yes. Same thing with one virtual community event. Mm -hmm. You know, pop-up style events are great, but again, when are they going to be scheduled? So I guess, you know, my question is, what are we going to do differently to reach out, are we going to reach out to churches? Are we going to reach out to nonprofits? I mean, how how is this process going to be different so that the faces that if I were to go to every one of those events, I would see people I'd never seen before at a community event? Yeah, I can answer some of that. So a couple things that we do is we want to do kind of this broad outreach, but we also want to, you know, working with you all, identify questions and surveys around zip codes, around um, you know, age, what we feel is comfortable for people to give us information on. And what we can do afterwards when we get results is we can start to look at this in different ways and say, okay, we heard from this group predominantly, so we need to maybe adjust in the next phase to go out to that area, that community that we didn't hear from. Um, in our work, we have uh, worked with high school students, middle school um, principals. We've um, provided uh, opportunities for extra credit for schools sometimes. Um, we've worked with churches. And so all those things that you've listed are exactly what we'd want to do. I think the first step we would do once we're moving forward is develop a very detailed engagement plan. And so we'll want to look at the dates when we start, and we'll want to look at activities that are out there. We'll want to look at times that are available. And so th this is... This sort of bullet list will turn into probably 15 pages for each phase of our work. And then, as I said, we want to be flexible as we go into a next phase to think about what we need to adjust because we're not going to get it right the first time and we need to be a little bit nimble and figure out how we can adjust moving forward. Okay. Well, those are my questions. Thank you. Council Member Tarosas. Okay, so I just wanted to, to clarify uh, along uh, Councilmember Davis's line of questioning. My understanding is that LC does not pr prohibit the city from approving public open spaces, public recreational facilities, existing cultural arts and education uses. And so when I think of a great park, I guess to, to Gleam's point, I think how are we defining great park? I, I think grounding us in that is a great point. Um, like I think of Central Park. I used to live in St. Louis. I think about Forest Park. You know, there's obviously a museum there. Mm -hmm. There's um, outdoor entertainment venues. There's biking paths. There's walking paths. And I think, like, I just want to confirm, is that what we are thinking of when we're talking about a great park here? And so we've had some meetings with... Obviously, we don't want to presuppose a community engagement. I get that. Right, yes. Yeah. I mean, we, we, we want to be open to hearing what's going on or the... what what we're thinking about, but the, the way that park is defined in our, um, our uh, municipal code allows for a lot of those things. It allows for concessions. It allows right. for um, community centers. It allows for, right, those supporting, <clears throat> excuse me, supporting or ancillary um, 
amenities that help a park function, right? You're allowed to build restrooms. Yes, it's a building, but it's necessary for a park, right? So um, with we, we do have some latitude within park what that means, right? Um, and so it could include things like those uh, community centers, right? We've heard people talk about child care centers or senior centers, right? Those sorts of things. Those Absolutely. seem to be, we, we, we again have to spend a little bit more time on that. Um, and that's where, you know, we in that first phase, that's where we can really dial this in. Um, but that's our understanding. And, you know, I've, I've stood on the runway and you look straight out to the ocean and it's beautiful. And are we thinking about Kind of like event spaces, concert spaces, cultural spaces where people can come and also see the ocean in a beautiful show. Yeah, no, there's, there's a lot of ideas about there, out there about amphitheater spaces mm -hmm. and, um, having some sort of performance spaces mm -hmm. because it is, you know, we're, we're Jason, we're, we're near Hollywood. We've got a lot of folks in a lot of different, very creative areas. Yeah. And I would just say that, um, you know, I didn't hear a lot about who we're reaching out to, uh, and and I know that this there's not consensus here around who we reach out to, but I would say that this is a community amenity, not just for Santa Monica, right? We are surrounded on our you know three corners, if you will, or three borders, by uh, the city of LA, um, and and so I think it's important. I'm just vocalizing that hopefully there's some sort of plan to do outreach to stakeholder groups that are not just in Santa Monica. I'd say right now we're focused on Santa Monica because okay. we want to understand what our community wants um, and needs and 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 what that looks like. Right, we are funding it at this point, sure. but um, as we explore additional funding opportunities and those sorts of things, I would imagine that that would be we'd be open to that. But um, in the beginning, we're really focusing on Santa Monica. I would just say that if we need to make this project work financially, it's not just going to be funded by Santa Monica. We're going to have to get considerable subsidy, I believe. Um, and so I think it's important to bring stakeholders along for a process that folks feel included in and bought into so that we can ultimately get different funding sources. Um, also on the language access issue, I was a little bit concerned that I only saw Spanish and English. Mm -hmm. I think it's important that we at least, ha Google Translate is not perfect, but we have some threshold languages and we've determined that are there other languages that folks speak? And then also at all of the community engagements that we have simultaneously, simultaneous translation, sign language, et cetera, for anyone that needs to be participating so we can make it as inclusive as possible. Uh, absolutely. And we, we've, okay. um, I, I would just say, um, we have two languages. We've done a project up to six languages. Okay. We did a website in six languages. We did every survey in six languages. So I think if, if you feel like there's three, four languages that would make this feel more inclusive, we should definitely explore that. Yeah. And I would a little bit defer to our, um, equity work um, to see what, what we think we need. Um, also, have we conduct, has Sasaki conducted research to figure out like the best times of day, the best days of the week, et cetera, to conduct these types of events? Because I am concerned about making sure that we have access for not just the same voices. Yeah. And I think, again, when we get into this, we'll, we'll have to learn and adjust as we figure out who we're talking to, who we're missing. Um, but we definitely know that uh, in the middle of the day is not great. At the end of the day, if people have childcare, if they don't have childcare, that's not great. So we need to provide different options, and that's where a lot of these pop-ups come from. I think one of the most successful events I've seen in the past year is we did it right when school got out. We provided activities yep. for the children. We had a free um, snow cone uh, <laughs> food truck, and we had lines of kids, and then while the kids were, you know, talking with us in doing their uh visioning their park the parents were taking the survey and giving us great feedback so maybe and it's free snow cones are you also planning on meeting people i mean to that point about meeting people where you where they are other community groups that meet on a regular basis um that are important stakeholders in the community etc going to those meetings making sure that we're going to our farmers markets etc meeting folks where they are basically yeah i would yeah. say that that is probably the best way yeah. to to get to people is to tag on to an event that yeah. already exists that's well attended when we're asking people to come for a big right. event it, it is to that question you know are we are we missing the times are we you know are we looking for something else so Going to events that are already established and are happening is the best best way to get a lot of people. And I would also just, I, I know our um, Rec and Parks Commissioner offered to serve as a resource, but hopefully we can make sure that they're engaged. Yeah, okay, thanks.
Uh, Council Member Parra. Hi there. Thank you so much, both of you, for the great presentation. Um, I just had a lot of my questions were answered, um, but I did have a couple questions regarding, um, as well, regarding the outreach. Um, can you elaborate, so uh, milestones, the outreach milestone, going back to this. Um, so you indicated that up to one digital survey um, would be conducted, and then in parentheses it says digital via project website and in person when necessary. Can you elaborate on what this looks like? Yeah, so one best practice is whatever we offer in person, we want to offer digitally. Whatever we offer digitally, we want to offer in person. So if we have an online survey, mm -hmm. we also want to make sure that people can give that exact feedback to us in person. So whether if it's a paper survey that they're filling out while they're going through and, and talking to us, that they can do that. And I think the reference to the website is um, when we create a website that's kind of the clearinghouse, that that's where you can go take the survey. We would, of course, want people to push it through social media, making those connections and having links to that survey to be taken. But you could always come to the website and find the information that's happening currently. And so when you, um, when you push it out through social media or what have you and you have it on the website, do you require some type of demographic information? Because I know, for example, when we have something that has anything to do with affordable housing, um, you know, there are like the housing advocates that will send it out through, you know, that action network. And the next thing you know, we're like bombarded by, you know, emails. And we'll get like 20 emails from Santa Monica residents on affordable housing, but like, 500 from people that live all through the United States. And so how do we weed out, um, you know, surveys from people that are, you know, I mean, I don't know. I mean, are we weeding out surveys from Santa Monicans um, versus people outside of Santa Monica? Or are we collecting surveys from everybody? So what is what does that look like? Um, we would want to work, we always work with our client to identify what is um, appropriate and what they want to use in terms of collecting demographic information. I would say we always want to do zip codes to understand if people are taking the survey from across the country. Mm -hmm. We can say, you know, maybe they visited and they have this great idea and they have family here. So we might want to look at it collectively, but we also might want to isolate that and look at just the community here too. So that that's one um pretty good uh, collector of information. Yes, you know, I would be, I would, I'd have a serious concern about, you know, the affordable housing advocates um, here because they're a very, very strong uh, special interest group in the city. And so if there wasn't any way to kind of vet that, um, you will be bombarded, like for sure. And so, I mean, I'm, I'm not, I'm just, it is what it is. It'll, and so it will definitely skew, um, it'll definitely skew what, you know, Santa Monicans would need. I'm not saying that Santa Monicans don't want housing there, but what I'm saying, the real numbers of what they want in terms of how many people actually want housing there. And so I would be really seriously concerned about that. And so I just wanted to put that out there, kind of plant the seed to think about that, you know, when, when you're, you know, you're doing um, their surveys to be able to capture and to make sure, I mean, there's a lot of different special interest groups, you know, one way or the other. And so um, we just have to take that into consideration when we're creating, when you're creating the QR codes, the surveys, the, you know, some type of way to that, that information, just so that we make sure that we have, you know, the most accurate to be able to um, have some good information. Um, what else? Um, I, and I had a chance to look at a bunch of your projects. Um, the Wilmington Waterfront Project, the Reed Park Project, the projects that you did in China are really great. Um, I'm a city planner by education, although I never practiced. But um, it was really cool to see the work that you've done. Um, so that was really cool. Um, let's see here. I wrote some other questions down over here. Um, Um, oh, yeah, just now I brought up QR code. Um, no, I think that's all for now. Thank you. Council Member Negretti. I'm going to try with Mayor my, Pro Tem. Sorry. of my voice I have left. <coughs> um, 
I have cough drops if you want. <laughs> I've had so many <laughs> cough drops. I, I have like idea. numbing agents on my throat. <laughs> <clears> throat. I wish I knew sign language. Um, I wanted to ask you about, um, I think you kind of answered the digital survey part. I, I'm still not really clear like how you can discern whether someone's really a resident or not. That's answering that question. Um, and I guess we don't really know what your questions will be. I think that's kind of what maybe Mayor Davis was alluding to, right? Like you have to guide people into a conversation and that's <clears throat> the concern. Are we having an open dialogue? Because you can ask a question and it can be specific, but people take it upon themselves to make it open-ended. And you're going to have to take into consideration their comments regardless. And they're just comments <clears throat> and ideas and they'll come back to us. But in terms of your questioning, I mean, I know you're not going to sit here and lay it out right now, but is that something that's being presented to council? Or are you guys just sort of taking what we're saying tonight? And I'm not saying that you have to. I'm just asking what the process is. Um, I can say for sure that <clears throat> developing questionnaires will take many, many rounds of, of editing iterations. Um, and so uh, we'll do a first draft. There'll be a lot of back and forth and, and vetting that. Back and um, forth from who? Sorry. Uh, uh, with, okay. Yeah, with, with city staff. Um, and so I think that um, if, if that is an option, I mean, I don't want to speak for you, but maybe that is where you look at the surveys. I think... Some of the questions I know we're very focused on a couple of the, the programming, but we also want to have some of the questions be more a spatial and thinking about what do you <coughs> want to, to look and feel in this great park? And that's what we did in Baton Rouge. It's a 660 acre park. And from that, we teased <coughs> out that people really wanted more of an ecology focus with friendly um, family events and, and recreation was a little less important. And so we we're able to sort of pull that out too. Okay. <coughs> And then I was just, oh, go ahead. I was just going to say, one other thing that I've heard Anna talk about, right, in, in a survey, it's not saying, what do you want to see here, right? It's more of the questions like that, whereas how does it feel? What is this experience like? Is it closer to this or is it closer to that? Like, where are we? What, what does this feel like and what experiences do you want to have instead of, like, I, I want to have a... Uh, 10 pickleball courts or whatever it is, right? Which we will still get those questions as well. But um, it's it's trying to evoke a feeling about the park um, so that we can get into those conversations. Okay. <clears throat> um, I was just going to say that I did a series with the elementary schools um, and Grant Elementary specifically in our project-based learning schools. They built a whole diagram and I worked with them on what airport to park looks like. It was actually pretty amazing. They had regenerated, you know, food um, that they were going to give to the homeless that they're going to grow, an amphitheater, lots of sports space, dog park. Anyways, <clears throat> I just thought, I hope that we can work with our schools and our teachers. I can connect you with the teachers who are actually specifically working as a group because they are the future. They are going to be using these spaces. <clears throat> and I hope that somehow we can tie in the future of education, using outdoor education um, as a part of it. So just putting it out there that there's teachers that are already guiding their classwork and it actually goes scaled by grade. And so it's really awesome what they've um, created so far. And then the other thing was just obviously you're probably going to use libraries and things like that, but on the tip of schools, because we know that those are families that, not to be assumed, but maybe have planted some roots here that will see, you know, it's not like a transit. Now, I'm not saying that someone who's living here for a year doesn't have a say, but and we're, you know, they may not be here to see the fruits of their opinion. So making sure that we're working with PTA Council and PTA <clears throat> to get out those 10,000, um, to all those 10,000 parents. There's concerts and there's other ways to set up pop-up tents. Um, there's giving kids in high school credit um, for, you know, there's a lot of people doing urban development programming, especially at the project-based learning schools. Um, so I think there's a lot of ways when you engage kids somebody who has had four kids, um, we're notified when a kid is doing a project that's local. And it actually, when I worked with the third graders, the families really got involved. So it was a way to get that information back to the adults. And maybe there's a way to have people make sure that they engage in both a physical and virtual activity if their kids are also a part of it. I'm just throwing that out there. I could talk about this for hours. <laughs> I have uh, four-year-old <laughs> twins and... Uh, kids are the most creative and passionate individuals, and so we we love that. I love all of those ideas because um, we want to create generational stewards. We want people to have this tie when they're kids. They want to stay here. They want to have their kids, and they want to 
remember what this great park is. So yeah, yeah. love all, all those ideas. Mm -hmm. Good. Yeah. Council Member Zwick. Thank you for the presentation. It's really exciting to um, be at the start of this process. Um, we talked about this nearly a year ago, and I'm, I'm, I'm just, you know, obviously we've talked about it for 30 some odd years or 100 some odd years in this community, so um, it's really a privilege to get to be uh, launching this endeavor today. Um, all the scenarios, I know I know we've gone back and forth on semantics. It seems like you're going to come up with multiple scenarios. All of them are going to involve a great park. We can parse what that means, but I imagine it's a park that's big um, and serves the community in a number of different ways. Is, is that right? Yes. yes. <laughs> OK. Um, and, and it seems like there's a value that's shared on the council and by staff and, and Sasaki around a, a really inclusive community outreach process. Is that right? Yes. That's yes. Um, I imagine um, one way that we can be inclusive is, you know, not turn people away if they don't have a very specific view of how something should go. I think, as you mentioned, the questions could be open-ended. They wouldn't be very specific. They could talk about how you want to feel in a place or, or at least give people the freedom to feel like they have the freedom to, to say. I mean, is it, I guess what I'm asking is, if we were to say, We'd love to do community outreach, but you actually can't talk about X, Y, or Z in this process. I mean, isn't that inherently exclusionary in some way? It's it's a fine line, right? And that's kind of um, on one hand, right? The the what we heard on the tenth was that we wanted it an inclusive process of everyone and as many voices as we can possibly get to. And so we heard that and we took that to heart. And the way that this is designed is to reach out to folks in the languages that they understand, right, in the places where they are already going, um, so that we can reach a lot of folks and, and have new voices uh, as well as our current voices, right, to have all of those voices included. Um, that's where in the process, it's got, we've got those two points in there to say, right, at that first milestone where we can say, you know what, we're hearing these types of things, let's work on these or those or focus on this or that. Um, and then again at those guiding principles. Right? The guiding principles are really another opportunity to say, um, now we really want to focus on these things or those things because now we've had all of this community input. And so we think that the process allows for that, um, that we can, we can have both. Well, um, I'll just say that I've, you know, I've heard a lot of great comment tonight from my residents, and I've heard a lot um, at other points in time. And uh, it's my belief that, you know, the, the more, um, you know, there's a lot of debate over what is an inclusive process. There was a previous one floated, and, and and people disagreed over whether that was more or less inclusive. What what I would say that I think we all would agree on is, it would be a process where we hear from everyone as much as many as people as we can, and we let them speak as freely as they can. And, and you know, if there's an overwhelming consensus, um, we'll hear that. Um, but I, that we don't pre-screen anyone um, in this process and that we really allow it to be open and inclusive. Thank you. Hi. I'll take a turn. So um, first of all, your firm has been doing amazing work and I for one really appreciate I've been to one or two of the parks that your firm has created that I know of um, but overall I really appreciate your dedication to the process and uh, above all the the fact that these parks that you have helped transform have been great assets for the communities they serve, both residents, visitors, um, and I'm extremely impressed. So um, a couple of things. I, I look at my view of our mandate is to create a park that has cultural, sports, art, it is passive activity. It's um, 
as well as active recreational uses. And uh, to me, an ideal park there would include, as uh, Council Member Davis has mentioned, an auditorium. It might include, as I've mentioned, uh, ice skating and ice hockey arena. It might include, as Council Member Tarosas mentioned, a great outdoor gathering space. So I think there is such a variety of uses that can be put in there. And I, and I was thinking about this. Uh, what's the square miles in Manhattan? Is it about 24, 25 square miles? Central, no, Manhattan. How big is Manhattan? I don't, I don't know. I okay. think it's like 22 miles long, but I don't oh, it know is? square miles. Okay. But I was just thinking about the fact that they have Central Park, which is 880 some odd acres. Um, if you slice and dice, our park could be 125 to 200 acres, including cultural uses, other uses, daycare, uh, a great senior facility, which we don't have in the city right now. There are so many uses that we could reach out and grab. And yes, we'll have to figure out how to pay for all of them. And I don't expect, and I hope nobody expects, on January 1st, 2029, we wake up and instead of going to the Rose Parade, we go out to the airport. <laughs> and it's suddenly transformed into this amazing parkland. But having been a Recreation and Parks Commissioner in the city for almost 14 years, I believe strongly that in a city that has always been under parked, always, maybe not in 1920, 1927, when uh, Clover Park originally was a park before it became Douglas, maybe not then, but after that was taken away at the start of World War II, and we never, it never returned to parkland, even though it's already been paid for by a parks bond, that we never had the park we needed. And we've been talking about adding density in the city. We're talking about adding more apartments of all types, affordable, market rates, super affordable, all these different things. Those people who are coming into our city will need recreational spaces. We already never, ever have as much field space as we need in the city. Never. We have people who would go out and play adult soccer at midnight if we would leave it open. We have people who are trying to play rugby, lacrosse, and now girls flag football. There are so many different athletic uses, and we have a, a high school where about a third of the students, 30% or so of our students, are involved in high school athletics. That is an amazing amount for a school. Our weather, our climate, our dedication to be outdoors, from bicycling paths in that great park so that our city manager will have a, a safe place to ride in the morning. Now that he's, that, now that he's yeah, now, I, I'm not going to mention that one. <laughs> I, I have to be able to talk to him again. But, <laughs> but, um, but there are all these things that I can imagine there. I take generally three to four mile walk every morning. This week, not I, I'm not making my goal right now. But, you know, when I look at that and say, geez, we'd have a safe place for people to commune, people to walk, people to play chess, checkers, all these different things that people do and want to do. This parkland has envisioned by First of all, council members from 100 years ago and by residents in 2014 who rose up and, yes, had a fight between uh, forces partially sponsored by the city council, right, versus the people who said, we want to keep that airport open forever and we don't care if the pollution turns your oranges black every day. It doesn't matter to us. We have a responsibility to honor the 60% of residents who voted in that election. Now, yes, it's not 100%. And we know there are many different views about the airport. There are some still who want to keep it open. There are some that believe, wow, let's imagine the housing we could build there. 
Imagine the high rises. Imagine the mid rises. And then the other residents, and I'm thinking about those little kids that Council Member Negretti mentioned at Grant Elementary, at Grant, who at five, six, seven years old are excited about a park. We don't build parks for us. We build parks the same way we plant trees. We build them for the future. Building a park, planting a tree, shows that we're entirely optimistic about humanity. In this city, that park would be our cornerstone. That park would forever provide 200 years from now, 300 years from now. And even if we have a cataclysmic uh, tidal wave, that parkland would now be beachfront property. But, and we hope that never happens. I, I just have to mention that. But I think it is an admirable goal. And I believe in the goals that you've set out between staff and Sasaki. And I think our residents will want to communicate, will want to talk. Not only the residents who are west of that flight path, but residents from all through the city, because residents from all through the city voted in what they thought was to push to close the airport. This was not uh, neighborhood voting. This was people from every neighborhood in the city. They believed in the future, and they believed in a brighter, less noisy, calmer future where they had parkland to enjoy. This is not the time to discuss housing. Now, uh, Council Member Zwick, Council Member Davis may be absolutely correct. You may have all these public meetings, and people come back and say, wait, we were happy with the 50 acres of park and we'd like 50 acres of housing. Entirely possible, but I believe that's not what we are discussing today. We're discussing the possibility of building a park for future generations of Santa Monicans long after Council Member Davis, I, and City Manager White, who has now joined the are you now an AARP member? <laughs> so I had to get my piece in too. So, uh, well, well, you know, that's what we should buy you a membership. So I'll, I'll make sure we get you one for Christmas. It'll be under my limit. So uh, at any rate, um, so I, I, I know I'm belaboring this, but I think it's really important. I think we need to look at that future and we need to reach and we need to be optimistic and we need to plan something that's spectacular. Uh, the airport in Berlin is not complete. Uh, I don't know if the airport Meigs in Chicago is completely a park now or is it just sort of open space and hanging out? I don't know. But I suspect that very few of these are completely done unless you have the cooperation in Athens, you may have had the cooperation of the federal government there and the local government, so things can happen quicker. And yes, as Council Member Terosa said, we'll need to look for federal funds. But I don't believe we need to look to LA right now because this first and foremost has to be our park and then we'll welcome the world into our park. We're not going to put fences around saying, unless you're a Santa Monica, you can't come in. Absolutely not. I want everyone to enjoy our parkland. But the same thing I said in 2006 when I asked the Community and Cultural Recreation Director to put Santa Monica under the name of all of our parks. We wanted people to know that it's a Santa Monica park. And I want people know, to know that this park Davis Pond, Terosis uh, Lake, uh, Zwick's. Philanthropic dollars there. <laughs> we'll, we'll put together a funding there you uh, go. opportunity for you. Uh, yeah, uh, Council Member Zwick's library. Whatever it is at that park that we really enable the community to buy in, to support it, and feel it's absolutely theirs forever. Thank <laughs> you.
Council Member Davis. All right, I think everyone's had an opportunity to speak, so I'm going to make a motion. I would move that we, one, adopt a finding of categorical exemption pursuant to Section 15262 of the California Environmental Quality Act Guidelines. Two, that we award RFP SP2641 airport conversion to Sasaki Associates for a community outreach program, visioning services and a concept design collectively the process related to the future planning of the airport land in anticipation of the airport closure. Three, that we provide direction and approve the scope of services for the Sasaki contract. I think staff has gotten a lot of input. I think the one thing I would add to this uh, staff recommendation is we've been talking about having three options that at least one of the options absolutely comply with the limitations imposed by Measure LC so that there would not be required a vote of the people. So that will always be on the table, that there will be that option. But it leaves open the possibility for including input from the remainder of the community in connection with some of the other options. Is that clear? Understood. All right, four, that we authorize the city manager to negotiate and execute an agreement with Sasaki Associates for a community outreach process, visioning services and concept design in an amount not to exceed $2,070,000, including a 12% contingency fund for 21 months with future year funding contingent on council budget approval. Um, five, that we approve the position and classification changes necessary to dedicate a project lead for the airport conversion project as described in the funding and staffing recommendation section of this report. And six, that we authorize budget changes as outlined in the financial impacts and budget action section of this report. Is there a second? Second. Is there a second? Second. It looks like second. Yeah, Mayor, I propose that we vote for everything but the one that she made a change on. Oh, sorry. Mayor, I, I vote that we vote. I propose that we vote on everything but the one that uh, Davis made a, gave direction on. What number was that? Three. Three. And where, I mean, that would have to be a substitute motion. Well, actually, Council, the, the rules provide for if we have multiple sub items, any council member can request to divide the vote and vote on items separately. She gave direction to change. I said I didn't. I didn't change it. What I right. said was gave specific direction that one of the three options. There, there, yeah. Sorry. There wasn't. And there's nothing proposed in there in the staff recommendation. So I didn't change any recommendation. I just gave direction that at least at all times one of the recommendations that would be included in the process would be one that would not invoke Measure LC. Okay. So again, I would like to say. I like for I propose that we vote for all but three, vote for three separately. Is that a friendly amendment? Well, no, that's not. No, it's a procedural request that uh, any council member is entitled to make. So we can vote from separately. Okay, so you Does want to need a, full... a second, or it's just it's just no, it's automatic. Okay. Oh. so okay, you could so vote on everything be... but item three. Okay, and then vote on item three depending upon how that shapes up. Okay. Okay, so the motion is vote on number one, two, four, five, and six. Yes, yeah. in one vote. In one vote. Okay. Uh, no. Council Member Negretti? No. Council Member Zwick? Um, well, obviously, we're, we're, we're going to end up doing a vote that, that splits these out, and we'll, we'll see how that goes. I, I guess I would just say um, we're going to spend a couple million dollars reaching out to the community to ask it what it wants. I feel like it would really deeply illegitimize the process uh, to tell people what they're allowed to tell us what they want. Um, I, for one, happen to support a really great park there. I think that's pretty unanimous um, on this council. Uh, but I'm not really in support of uh, thought policing, and I don't think it will um, make this process appear legitimate to the community, and the whole point of it is to to hear from them. So. Sorry, sorry. All right, so let's, any other discussion? I'm sorry, Mayor Brock. If I may, before you vote on this item, um, at 8.13 p.m. I received a uh, communication from Council Member De La Torre 
Um, in accordance with Council Rule 5K, council members planning on being absent from a council meeting or a portion of a meeting may submit written statements on a topic on the agenda to the city clerk at least by noon the day of the council meeting. The city clerk shall publish the written statement prior to the beginning of the meeting and the city clerk shall read the statement into the record at the meeting. Since this was received late, um, it would be up to council's discretion to vote to suspend that rule um, to allow the clerk to read that uh, Free statement to the record, and then this clerk's office could post a statement on the website tomorrow with the item. Stay here. All right, so we would need a voice vote <laughs> to accept council member Delatory's <coughs> statement into the record. To suspend the rules and accept to suspend the, the rules and have that statement. Do we need a second on that, or is that just a vote? We need a motion. Second. We need a motion, second, and five votes. Okay. I mean, I'll make a motion to hear his statement. Second. Second is Para. Motion by um, Vice Mayor Mayor Frotem Negretti. <laughs> Boys vote, I believe. Do we need an individual vote, Clerk? I need five votes. Yeah, so we have to. Yeah, you need to do a roll call vote. Yes. 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 Reading into the record on behalf of Councilmember De La Torre, my comment regarding consultant Sasaki, I support the spirit of Measure LC and the right of Santa Monica voters to self-determination. More parks, open public space, recreational opportunities, botanic gardens, and urban forest. And that's the end of the statement. Thank you very much. Okay. Are we ready to vote on yes. yep. the motion? Can you do a roll call? Again, this is for clarification. We're uh, uh, trying to adopt the recommendation number one, two, four, five, and six. And again, that was a motion by uh, Davis, Davis second, second by Tarosis. Okay. Council Members Wick? Yes. Council Member Parra? Yes. Council Member Davis? Yes. Mayor Potem Negrete? Yes. Council Member Tarosis? Yes. Mayor Brock? Yes. Okay. Council Member Davis. All right. I move that with regard to subsection of the recommended action three, that um, I believe in the context of this conversation, we provided direction uh, regarding the scope of services for the Sasaki contract. And um, clearly, I think that they've heard that, uh, you know, a great park must be included in all of the options, but that at least one of the options, you know, among the three that they propose to present at some point in time, uh, fall within the scope of not requiring a vote by Measure LC. There is a motion by Davis, a second by Tarosis. I just want to clarify what you Discussion. mean by that. Discussion. Uh, I'm sorry. Whoa, I didn't put my name in there. There you go. Now it's official. <laughs> um, I just want to clarify what you mean by that, that it doesn't require vote. What we were talking about, that it would that it would go against LC, we'd have to go back to the people on a ballot measure? No. Well, right. So, so yeah, and I apologize if I wasn't articulate about it. So Sasaki was repeatedly talking about having three options that it would continually be developing. And what my motion says, at all times, one of those options should be an option that would not require a vote of the people under Measure LC. However, we define that because there may be some differences about what does and does not. But so that there would always be a motion on the, or, or one of the options would always be one that, if it were to be adopted, would not require a vote of the people of LC. So that, that option is always on the table. Meaning it wouldn't go against what was already voted on. The worry of the, that people, our constituents brought up that it might create a ballot measure, right, and jeopardize it is what you're speaking to. Well, no, because I thought what we made clear in questions answer, it. Sasaki doesn't get to do a ballot measure, <coughs> only the council right. can. So, so we're not deciding tonight if we should do a ballot measure, because we don't know what the process is going to yield, or when we should do a ballot measure. And I'm very sympathetic to the idea that we shouldn't do 
go to the voters prior to the closure of the airport because that will raise an electoral issue around the closure of the airport. And I think we've established tonight that we can go through this planning process but have the vote after the actual closure of the airport. But that would be up to the council. We're not deciding that tonight. What I'm trying to do is say we need to give some scope of the project to Sasaki. And all I want to do to allay the fears of people that somehow in this co in the scope of this project, we're going to lose sight of LC, that they're one of the options, of the three options that will always be presented to the public, that will come back to council, that will constantly be on the table, because they kept talking about the three options. One of those options will always be an option that however staff defines that, because I'm sure there might be some disagreement about what the LC box is, but one of those will always be an option that does not require a vote of the people under measure LC. So in, in theory, I mean, if you have the LC language, but it would be recreational. I can help here. Council. Yeah, yeah. In other words, one of the options would mean that you could develop nothing except parks, public open spaces, and public recreational facilities. Right, right. That would always be one of the options. But it would allow the process so that other options could be discussed and presented. So we wouldn't be, what I'm trying to do, avoid doing is prejudging the outcome of this process. It began with my question of why have this process if we're already going to decide what comes out at the other end. We can save ourselves a lot of money, no offense, Sasaki, you know, by just saying this is go forth and do this. Because it's the public outreach portion that costs a lot of money. The planning is expensive, but it's the public outreach that's expensive too. So all I'm saying is I want to make sure that we don't lose sight of what Measure LC does and make sure that one option that always complies with Measure LC is always on the table. That's all I'm saying. I'm just trying to understand because <clears throat> that is the premise of this anyways, and people can say whatever they want to say. I mean, you could ask me, hey, what is your vision of the park? And I could say, I'd like to have a rabbit farm and the whole thing should be a rabbit farm. And you might say, okay, that's interesting. You're not going to tell me you can't say that, right? Or someone could say that they want it to be all housing or half housing. I mean, so anyone, we can't stop anyone from saying it. I think the goal was just not to curate the conversation in a way that strays away from the intent. People are going to share what they want to do and you're going to, I assume, aggregate that information and come back to us and say, we were talking about a great park, but as a side note, there was a lot of conversation around other uses that don't fall under this. Is that how this works? I mean, we're just well, I mean, we're just reaching out to the community. I think what's worrisome is like changing it in this legal form. Just what are we doing? Not here? changing anything. I'm, I'm just giving an additional well, direction yeah, because, look, I think, I mean, you know, we can. I can't think of anything worse than going out and spending two point some odd million dollars on a public process. And having people come to meetings and say, what do you want to do at the airport? Uh -huh. And then at the end of the day said, thank you very much for that, but we're not really, we, you know, you wanted to build a smelting plant, but that's not on the table. Because the, the, end, pro the end of the process has already been prejudged. If the end of, this is my point, if the end of the process is nothing that would require a vote under LC, then why are we doing this? I have a question. I mean, that, that's, my, that's my thing. If, if we're going to go out into the public and people are going to give input and then we're going to say that's nice but we're ignoring your input, I don't know why we're doing that. No, I just wanted to respond to that. I think my we're one at a time. So I think the point is because it does say recreation. It does say whatever. And today pickleball, for example, is a very big deal. Ten years ago we weren't talking about it. So I assume that the conversation under LC is like, do we want an amphitheater? Do we want pickleball? I don't know. By the time we get to this conversation, a new sport might erupt and we might be talking about that. That's how I understood this conversation to evolve. It's not to prohibit anyone from saying anything. People are going to talk about what they want to talk about, but it's to go in forth forward with the idea that we're talking about outdoor space, recreation, arts, whatever that may look like. And that's why there's a need for discussion because if we just give, turn it over to a company to design it, they might not think of all of the things that the community wants there. We might want more learning gardens than you may have presumed or whatever. Is that? Get in there. <laughs> uh, my bad. Oh, you have control. OK. Um, we we absolutely want to listen to the community. And all of those things that are listed, even though it's three bullets, 
each one of those bullets has so many options within it. And we don't, we don't know what people love in Santa Monica until we talk to them and understand them. And we can put out, you know, all these different ideas. But if we designed this in isolation, we would be missing, you know, what is that new sporting uh, opportunity or, you know, the disc golf tends to come out really strong sometimes in communities or horseshoes. Like we want to hear those because there's a lot of things that we need to understand in just those three bullets. Well, can I ask a question then? So are you saying that if you, we go through this public process, you're going to tell people, we're, we're, we're here to listen to about all your ideas about recreation and cultural activities and what that means, whether it's pickleball, horseshoes, tennis, natatorium, ice skating rinks or whatever. We want to listen to all of that. But if you want to talk about things that might require a vote under LC, we don't want to hear about that. I mean, that, that, that's really the question. And if that's what you're saying the process is going to be, then we should know that. And, and our community should know that, quite honestly. Because I don't want people to take their time to come and say, I would like to see 20 acres out of the 200 acres devoted to housing. And have you all come back and say, well, we heard of some people who wanted to build housing, but we don't care. Because then we might as well just tell people don't show up. If that's what you're going to talk about. I'm just, I'm just trying to make sure that this is an honest process. And it's not honest to say, we want to hear what you have to say, but have prejudged that whatever the outcome is, is got to fall within the rubric of LC. And I suspect that's why you were talking about three different options. And, and all I was trying to do was make sure that the one option, which I think there is strong support for, which is one that would never cause an invocation of the LC, requirements would always be on the table, that we would never lose sight of that. Now, you know, I mean, maybe someone says, I want all three to fall within that rubric, in which case, you know, then again, you have to, I, I would just say, then you have to be honest when you go out into the public and say, don't come to us and talk about building housing, don't talk to us and come about building a, a grocery store that could service nearby house, don't, you know, or anything that would require a vote because we're not considering that. And, and you know, I mean, all I'm asking is that we be honest because I just think if you have a process where people come in and you say, tell us your thoughts about the airport, and then you hear their thoughts and you basically start slicing them off, saying because that doesn't fall within LC, then they're going to feel quite honestly betrayed. Why, why did I waste my time? So I think all, all I'm trying to do is make sure to be responsive to the portion of the community that always wants to make sure that there's one option that wouldn't invoke a vote under LC, but would also leave open the possibility that people could participate in the con con conversation and mention other things. Now, apparently that's a bad thing, but in any Council event, that, Council that, Member Davis, thinking. Mayor Brock, I would just like to assistant city manager Klein just to clarify a few points. No pressure. Um, so I'll try to be super clear. Um, the engagement process that we're proposing um, to get direction on tonight is one that we're all very familiar with. We're going to the community and asking community participants at four different junctures. We have four different milestones. So we're going to do everything, the seven types of outreach that are identified under each milestone, we're going to do that four times. So the surveys, the big meeting, all of that at each of those four phases. And it's open to the community. Anyone who participates can share whatever their hopes and dreams are about what they want to see on all 227 acres at the airport. Our job, I mean, I, is to document it and evaluate the possibilities of it and bring it back to council so that we can get direction from council on what limitations we should put on the, the community feedback we got. I can't honestly tell you how staff would parse through what, you know, would qualify for a recreational facility and, you know, in a community meeting to tell someone that doesn't fit or it does fit. So um, I, I, and 
And that, that's just an impossible position, I, I think, for us to be in. I, I want to be super clear that our intention, at least what we're recommending to get direction on, is to go out to the community, hear what they have to say about what they want to see uh, on, on the airport at multiple phases, and at each at the end of each phase, we'll come back to council and say, this is what we heard. You know, people wanted to see X, Y, and Z in this area, and they wanted to, you know, redevelop X, Y, and Z in this area, and we'll bring that back to you, and then you'll give us direction on what to flesh out, what what isn't worth pursuing based on what you're hearing in the community and what we're presenting and the feasibility, the technical data information that we're going to bring back as well. Um, so, you know, we have some environmental work. So there will be, it will be informed by some of that environmental work. And, and then that will help refine after the four junctures that we come back to council with community feedback on. That will refine the scenarios at the very end. If we get direction to make at least one of the of the scenarios, um, you know, uh, we'll work with we'll have to work with the city attorney's office because again, there's it the inter, how we uh, interpret LC and what triggers it is going to be something that we're going to work with the city attorney's office very closely on, so we can make sure that at least one of the proposed of scenarios won't. Uh, require a vote with uh, pursuant to LC. It will be consistent with the recreational activities and with the reuse of existing facilities and and with consistent uses. So I, I hope that's, and that's the way it's written. clear. All right, yeah, guys, so, we're going to so go in order. That's clear. Then yeah, okay. <clears throat> Council Member Zwick. I was, I was going to try to clarify, but I, I, I think the assistant city manager did a good job. And if, um, if that's the process and we all agree on it, I, I don't see why we can't vote and approve it today. Council Member Parra. Same. That was my understanding, was that the community was going to say what they wanted to see and then based upon what they wanted to see and what was synthesized, was brought back to us, and then based upon what we can and cannot do, that was going to be the decision. And so uh, that's why I didn't understand why we were trying to change the direction. So that's why I wanted to pull that one out. Um, can we, guys, we don't want to talk out of turn. And uh, do you have something yeah, you'd like to add? Substitute motion just to move item three the way staff proposed it. Great. Sure. I well, mean, I'll yeah, second that. Well, including Ms. Klein's comments? Well, the, the, her comments are pertaining to how it's proposed. I thought that's what you were just describing what we all sort of asked. The, <coughs> the we're going to go with what the proposal <laughs> is that's been motioned and second as a substitute motion by Council Member Negretti and seconded by Mayor Brock is that we. Uh, Substitute uh, Council Member Gleam uh, Davis's motion for the original recommended action on number three, which provides direction and approves the scope of services for the Sasaki contract related to RFP SP 24, uh, 2641, including the community outreach work. So, no additional changes. <clears throat> it's been moved and seconded. Is there a discussion on that? Okay, uh, can we call a roll call? Council Members Wick. Yes. Council Member Parr. Yes. Council Member Davis. Yes. Council, I'm sorry, Mayor Pro Tem Negrete. Yes. Council Member Terrell. Yes. yes. And Mayor Brock. Yes. And all segments of the Kentucky <coughs> contract and we look for great work from you. No pressure. No. <laughs> I'm excited. And Thank we you. Want the results tomorrow. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. completely yeah. done on a on yeah. opening day. Yes. Sorry. Sorry. Got it. Right okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Everyone looks so long. Um, we're at eleven.
6.05 p.m. Uh, can we have a motion to either adjourn or go past 11? Second on that. Second. All in favor? Aye. And we'll continue to finish the city's business. <laughs> Item 16A, appointment to one unscheduled vacancy on the Disabilities Commission for a term ending on June 30th, 2025. And at this time, we have no applicants for this seat. So we'll postpone and come back in late January and appeal to the public if you qualify for that vacancy on the Disabilities Commission, which is a very important commission for the city of Santa Monica that involves both parks, seniors, and involves every facet of our community. Please take 15 minutes and apply. You can go to santamonica.gov to find the necessary information under commission vacancies. Item 16B, request of Mayor Brock for council to approve providing the mayor pro tem the working title of vice mayor for ceremonial purposes. I move the item. Great second. All right. I uh, see no discussion and, and no need for comments okay. by me. Uh, can we take a vote? I'm sorry. Just to clarify, because I can't discern voices. Uh, who made the motion? Para, para, and para and Tarosis. Para and Tarosis. I'm the one with the deep voice. Well, not today. Oh, it's a voice vote. We can do a voice vote. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Council, I'm sorry. Item 16C, request of Mayor Brock that city manager and city attorney evaluate and return with an ordinance and program to allow banners to be placed on city light poles supporting arts and culture of Santa Monica. The program should be designed as government speech and allow for nonprofit submissions to promote arts and culture pursuant to a program approved by the council. Program guidelines and details will set forth in a resolution with clear guidelines on the expressive action, such as government support and promotion of community-based artistic and cultural events and causes that serve civic and public interest. Council will adopt submissions by resolution stating they reflect the views of the council. The city will maintain control and discretion over the selections and control installation. Staff will provide estimates of cost to the city for installation and program administration. So, can we move it? Oh, okay. Um, well, should I give a quick overview then? Um, so, very simply, Los Angeles City in 1984 uh, has they prepared for the Olympics, uh, started placing Olympic banners down Wilshire Boulevard, uh, down Exposition, down other parts of the city. And they still maintain that program uh, throughout their city. And uh, it generally supports cultural events. It never uh, promotes private events at all. And um, I know that the city attorney has looked at several cities' uh, requirements for this. We want to make sure this does not fall under uh, free speech, where anybody could put up a banner. But I think it would be a great way to help publicize events, publicize the history of the city, publicize our culture, and uh, on a limited basis. Um, so the, the city would come back in a few months with an idea of what the cost would be, uh, how we would charge the nonprofits, or what we would do to promote, let's say, a Pico neighborhood festival, or uh, a marathon or races, or you could name so many things, promote using our libraries. Um, we could decide at that point what streets, what avenues it would go on, what parts of the city. So all this is is a motion to explore the possibilities and match what other cities have done now for four decades in L.A. County. Council Member Tarosis. I just want, first of all, I'm very supportive of this. I think it's great we're doing this. I think it also, you know, provides uh, cultural affinity and, and activity in, in different quarters of the um, community. But are we intending for this to be revenue generating or who's going to actually pay for this? I, I would not anticipate it being revenue generating. However, uh, the cost and fees and creative ways to fund this would be done after uh, the city attorney the city manager and staff, they could include that as part of their decision-making process. 
Okay, because I mean, I just would say it would be great if we could have a mix. I mean, of course, this is has, this is going to be government speech, right? So we have to be careful about yeah. what we can put on these signs. I totally get that, but to the extent that like there's a play coming up and someone wants, yeah, or they want to purchase some of these light poles, I know that they do that in other jurisdictions. So if it met our guidelines of what we wanted to see on the polls, I would just say I'd be interested in exploring if if there are a mix of options for both like nonprofits and potentially like revenue generation. I absolutely agree with okay. you. Great. But I'm so fully supportive and I'm I'd like ready. to move hey. this item. Huh? I'd like to move this item. Okay, I'll second. There's no money, so I think we can do a voice vote. Okay. The attorney. Yeah. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? It passes unanimously. Item 16D, request of Council Members Wick, Council Member Davis, and Council Member Tarosis that the City Manager and City Attorney evaluate the potential to place a general tax with an advisory measure on the November 25th, sorry, November 2024 ballot to increase the parking facility tax to reduce traffic congestion and the risk of traffic fatalities and serious injuries in Santa Monica while preserving free 90-minute parking in the downtown lots. So specifically, the city manager is being asked to evaluate the potential resources that can be generated by increasing the parking facility tax and the use of resources to restore the safe routes to school program and fund safety enhancing street infrastructure to protect children, elderly, and disabled residents, hire additional school crossing guards and traffic enforcement officers, and address deferred maintenance needs to the city's downtown parking structures. The city manager and city attorney are also being asked <coughs> to enter into discussions with the California Coastal Commission and assess the impacts of a proposed increase in the parking facility tax on parking rates in the coastal zone. Um, could I hear from either one of the sponsors? Councilmember Zwick. Thank you. Um, it's always a late hour when we get to these 16 items, so I'll try to keep it brief. Um, uh, this item began, as we all know, um, uh, with, uh, with a really tragic death in our community um, around six or so weeks ago. And um, we responded very quickly um, to make that intersection uh, safer, and I really appreciate the entire council's efforts in, in, in making sure that happened. Uh, but you know, in the course of that, um, and in the course of talking to residents on on Idaho, um, residents that live near Franklin uh, on Idaho and 21st, or Idaho and 18th, or many other um, intersections, uh, especially two-way intersections around the city that that were perceived to be dangerous and often are dangerous. A lot of people have come to me and said, well, what about our intersection? Um, you know, that moved really fast. You know, when's our stop sign coming? And in, in discussion with uh, the city and the Department of Transportation, um, there's a number of factors that, that make it hard to move quickly. But one of the biggest right now for us is, is simply one of resources. Uh, I've talked to a family that lives near McKinley um, who said that they requested a stop sign near their school. And they've been waiting for more than a year to hear the results um, of, a, of a study as to whether it was warranted. And the simple fact of the matter is that um, whereas we once had uh, five full-time employees uh, who, who served as uh, traffic painters, and, and, and that means not just painting the roads, but also putting up the stop signs and maintaining all the um, objects in the right of way, we, we now have one. And whereas we once had many people um, whose job it was, was to, uh, to study uh, and design these safety improvements, uh, the Department of Transportation suffered more cuts, and the Mobility Department uh, suffered more cuts than any other city department um, over the last few years due to COVID and the related budget shortfalls. Um, and specifically, also, there was a part-time position that was um, uh, assigned to manage the Safe Routes to School program, which was uh, uh, to specifically look at uh, safety-enhancing improvements to allow our children to safely walk and bike and scoot to schools. Uh, and that was another thing that now uh, is no longer an active program in the city. And um, uh, in all of this, um, uh, an opportunity seemed to arise uh, in the fact that we could not only perhaps um, restore some funding for these crucial positions and programs, but we could also bulk up other ways that we stay safer in our city, whether it's our school crossing guard program, 
uh, our, our traffic uh, enforcement officers um, uh, who, who are overstretched right now and simply trying to enforce the laws that we have on the books uh, that keep our residents safe. Uh, and finally, um, our downtown parking structures that have been pointed out um, numerous times um, by community members and business owners in the downtown to not always be um, the cleanest or the uh, have the most working elevators at all times. And the, uh, we've had a lot of deferred maintenance, and we simply don't have the resources that are currently assigned to this um, to make sure that those structures are as clean and safe as possible as well. Um, this is an opportunity. It, it simply obviously asks the city manager to study this, um, figure out exactly how much revenue could be generated uh, through different scenarios, do polling, talk to the community, and bring something back um, with more information that we as a council could consider. So I, I appreciate everyone's consideration, um, and uh, I, I hope you'll join me and, and, and the really large amount of uh, community members and parents um, that wrote it on this item uh, uh, in exploring this. Thank you. Council Member Tarosis. Yeah, I would just say that it, it, it became apparent to me anyway, um, after the really unfortunate traffic fatality that we had, that we have had a confluence of really high priorities during COVID. And one of the things that it was deprioritized, and I'm not hopefully talking of school here, was our commitment to our Vision Zero plan. And I think that we have all stated that safety first, right? We want to ensure that we have safe, streets that are bikeable, that are walkable, uh, that folk that our most vulnerable populations, our children, uh, our seniors, our disabled populations are able to safely get to and from their um, their destinations. And of course, as uh, Council Member Zwick mentioned, we absolutely have to restore our Safe Routes to School program. Um, I think that we know that there's a lot of deferred maintenance. We've talked, we've all talked about it at, on our parking structures. I think this is a really elegant solution. Um, to both preserve the, the free 90 minutes, but at the same time, um, potentially just generate a little bit more revenue uh, to make our city safer uh, and, and more functional for everyone here. So uh, hopefully you'll support this. Council Member Negretti. Um, I think this is great. We're missing a lot of our um, crossing guards. Um, and I know specifically schools that are not attached to the you know public schools um, in particular around St. Monica's, there's like three or four crossing guards that are missing and there's an elementary, <clears throat> middle and high school there. But one of the programs I'm curious about because I remember participating in it with my kids, but it was, we, we did it as a PTA, um, is also bike safety and traffic rules. Like, I don't know if that's a program that exists, but if we could consider adding to this, um, because I've had this conversation multiple times with bicyclists predominantly college goers at SMC and even high schoolers and their confusion around whether or not they have to stop at a stop sign. Um, we just had an incident on Pearl and 14th where people got out of their car and the bike and they were in an argument <clears throat> because a bicyclist ran the stop sign and thought that that was allowed and then they got into a whole thing and anyways, I've heard that back and forth, some confusion and also kids not really understanding like they just get on a bike and go, and they don't know when they lose the bike lane how to use their hand signals. So I don't know if the city has ever sponsored like a bike safety program. Um, I know PTA has in the past for Bike It, Walk It Day in Santa Monica, but it would be nice if we could add that to this too, if there is some sort of program. I don't know if it's done by traffic safety officers or, you know, the the maybe it's a good opportunity to combine PD and and, and bring PD in the fold because it could be a community event. I don't know. <clears throat> um, I just say that, um, you know, this is studying a number of possibilities, and that seems like one that would really fit well with the others that, that have been enumerated, whether that's, you know, through events that are encouraging people to bike to school, but also telling them how to do it safely, or whether it's things that PD is doing and educating the public. Um, you know, either way, I, I'm happy to include that among the list of possibilities. So, um, I, I agree with the concepts of this. I believe that uh, as we recover our finances, a lot of this can be accomplished within our city's financial structure without continuously asking for new taxes. And I'm concerned that we stop going to the public pockets every single time 
that we need something done. I will support the study, but I am and I remain concerned that, um, yes, traffic engineers, yes, street painters, yes, all those things are needed in our city, and we hope that our budget will recover. So a lot of the needs from bike rodeos uh, to all the other things that are needed can be accomplished through our existing financial resources. I, and I'm gonna repeat again, I'm very hesitant to keep dipping into residents' pockets who are already impacted by many other things and visitors' pockets. I don't want people to have to pay 15 or $20 to go to the beach. It is a public resource. It is a state-owned uh, resource. And there are still, I was with, uh, I'm a, a board member of uh, Santa Monica Bay Restoration Commission. Last week, we admitted a new board member uh, for the Black Surfers Association. And they bring children to the beach who have never been to a beach before and they live in Los Angeles. So I want to make sure that we don't make it so prohibitive for parents or children or grandchildren to use our facilities. This Many people don't get to take big vacations. Their vacation, their escape from their home is Santa Monica Beach and Santa Monica Pier. So I, I remain concerned about that. I'll support this motion but I am concerned. Uh, Council Member Zwick, some last words. I, I appreciate um, your support, Mayor Brock, and I, and I hear your concerns. Um, I would just say that the, the item at the bottom, or the sentence at the bottom, that, that speaks to the city speaking with the uh, uh, Coastal Commission um, reflects in part that concern that very well um, the city um, is governed in a number of ways and when, when it sets parking rates uh, and parking and the Coastal Commission has a say in that and that it likes to preserve access and one way it does, it perceives that as in making sure that um, people can affordably park um, near the coast. And there's a quite high likelihood that the, the, the our rates that we set um, will not change even amidst uh, this tax, um, depending on what Coastal Commission says. It, the majority of the revenue that's generated from it is more from private operators um, that often charge higher rates um, than we do, uh, valet stands and other things like that as well. Um, so I, I think there's a way to balance this. Um, and I also would say that, you know, if, you know, in the extreme scenario, we're talking about a 10% or something, we would look to different scenarios, obviously, but, you know, which, which would mean that if you paid $5, this would imply paying an extra 50 cents. And I, and I don't see that, you know, while it adds up to something meaningful in aggregate, I, I don't see it as a disincentive for people who want to access our city. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, can we take a vote on this? We need a motion. Anyone want to I'll, make a motion? I'll Probably move, the maker. I'll move the motion. And one of the other makers. Uh, so it's Zwick and then Terosa seconded. Now that I'm Mayor Terosis is taking over all the seconding duties. Oh. I appreciate that. I'm trying to move no, that's fine. Okay. Uh, can we call a vote? We can do a roll call. I'm Actually, we can vote. do a voice vote, can't we? Yes. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? The motion passes unanimously. With that, uh, I hope I speak on behalf of the entire council when I wish everyone listening, watching, that they have a wonderful holiday season, that they have peace in their heart, whether they uh, celebrate Kwanzaa, Festivus, uh, Christmas, etc., and that all of you had a great Hanukkah. And lastly, that on New Year's Eve, all of you will go out to Palisades Park and look at the last sunset of the year and it'll remind everyone why you, why you live in our beautiful, great city. Merry Christmas, happy holidays, and have a wonderful 2024. We'll see you next year. When's the next meeting? The next meeting is, hold on. Next meeting is January 23rd, uh, scheduled at 5.30 p.m. And we'll see you then. And on Christmas Day, you'll see me frolicking because it's my 70th birthday. Oh, 70.
That's really old.